Good morning, and welcome to The Review, the Instagram Live podcast for Kanama news, culture, and stories are shared over the warmth of coffee. Guys, this weekend is quite special. It is our first Calgary Kanama Jam of the new year. We are gathering in Kensington tomorrow, out in the park, out in Riley Park, to play some Kanama, to gather, and just enjoy this game we all freaking love. So excited about it. On top of that, it was the restocking of Cafe Kendama. You can pick up some Damas on there as well as we got a couple of mugs left. Not too many. But more importantly than both of those things, you guys are here today because we are bringing Zach Gallagher to the review to share his story, journey through his progression as a player, all the way to today where just recently he won the Sweets Kendama's Open Pro Invitational. We are super excited to get him on here to learn a lot from him because Zach is one of the greatest players to have ever touched a Kendama. And that is pretty exciting to me. I remember a few years back when I was at MKO 2018, I said this in the post, uh, we were in the, the hotel going down in the lobby. We were out front of the pool. There's like hundreds of people just seshing Dama there. And I see Zach, Nick, and a couple other people from the Sweets Kanamas team just practicing the pro open tricks like they were practicing big cups. It was crazy. The amount of consistency that Zach has when it comes to Kendama is utterly insane. So we are super excited to dive into the mindset behind one of the greatest players in the game that we all know and love. Uh, On top of that, though, you guys know it. If you've been here before, you know that we like to shout out some community members by asking ourselves the question, what are you drinking this morning? You know, as always, I got a fresh cup of coffee here, brewed it myself this morning with my AeroPress. I know so many of you guys have been picking up AeroPress, which is kind of crazy to me that you guys are following in this little movement that we've somehow started. And if you're wondering what AeroPress is or how to do it or how to brew it, I got a blog on my website that you can check out and you can brew AeroPress like I do. You can also use my link and get some some beans at a discount from one of my favorite roasters, Phil and Sebs. I just brewed a Kenyan this morning from them. I can't remember what the name was. Maybe I'll take a picture later and post it on the stories. But nonetheless, I want to know what you guys are drinking this morning. We'll shout some people out. But before we do, I want to take a little special moment here for a quick second. Uh, Usually I like to plug a couple things, but I don't want to plug anything related to me here in the moment. Uh, I want to plug Kendama Cinema. I want to plug movies that have been created in the Kanama world. First off, guys, if you don't know, YouTube is a great platform to find incredible Kendama films, edits, cinema, you name it, content. So much good stuff. I just spent the morning finishing watching uh, Stay on Your Tablet by Kendama France. Guys, if you have not watched this, you need to go watch that film. It's like 37 minutes of pure Kendama chills. I literally had chills all through my body watching that. It was what got me into Kendama. Those types of movies, those types of films, that content is the stuff that really instilled the fire deep in my heart to play this game. Because I wanted to be there. I wanted to go to the events. I wanted to travel. I wanted to meet the people. And the way they captured those moments is so beautiful. So go watch that. That's brand new. It just came out. On top of that, uh, go check out Cooper Eddy's mod. He just did a rebranding of his mod and released it. Uh, and it was just dropped again. And I, I shout this out because, A, we got a Sweets Kanamas Pro on here. So we got to shout out the sweets. We got to give some sweets love here today. But on top of that, Coop is an incredible cinematic legend within the Kanama world. Uh, Coop has been a great influence in progressing cinema for Kanama in the past decade or more. He's kind of one of the guys who really kicked off that progression. So let me say this. Uh, go create movies. I have been preaching this all along. I'm really bad at living this because I don't like editing, but uh, you guys go and create movies, put them on YouTube, put heart and soul into it. Tell a story. If you want to gain followership, if you want to gain, you know, rapport within the community, one of the greatest ways to, to do that is by telling a great story. So go check it out. Go check out these films. There's a ton of other ones. Make sure you let me know what ones I've missed. There's so many great ones that came out. Colin Hislop, we're getting him on the brew view in a couple weeks to talk through his 365 day edit as well. Let's take a quick moment here. Let's read through the chat, see what you guys are all drinking this morning, and then let's get Zach on here and dive into this week's brew view. What do we got here from the chat today? I see SJW Kanama Watermelon Shred Bull. Some Red Bull. Uh, he's been apparently drinking a lot of it. He can't spell it properly. SJW Kanama, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. We are very excited about the jam. Uh, we got Luke and Dama Celsius. Yeah, it's pos- positive temps out today in Canada. 
Osama bin Laden with his monster energy, Nick Walsh with the water. We got Dustin A. Nut, nothing fancy, fancy, some Costco brand medium roast. Sometimes you got to get that stuff. You know, you got you to gotta grind through it. Uh, Ryan Taluk there. I don't know how to say your last name. Please forgive me. Uh, he's drinking some Brazilian coffee. We got some Brazilian coffee fans in the house. Awesome. Awesome. We got lots of great stuff in here. Iced coffee from Haley Bischoff. Faith Kendama drinking. Stoke. Some Stoke Town. And Josh Flo Grove with the mate. Oh my gosh. Yes. We got to get Josh on here sometime. We'll talk. We'll talk tea. Guys, I do like tea. I came out and I said it the other day. So let it just be known. I do enjoy tea. The, the feud's over. So let's get Zach on here and let's dive into this week's brew view. As all- uh, this is a live conversation. You guys have an incredible opportunity to participate in this conversation by asking questions. You can drop them put down them. in the chat. You can put them in the comments. Or if you're a Patreon, you can submit them ahead of time and make sure your questions are asked with priority. Zach, oh my goodness. Yo, how's Dude, it going, Adam? Welcome here. I'm, I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing? Doing well. Got up this morning. And I was like, all right, day's finally here. Beer, beer, like, like let's get it, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Dude, I, so I, I try to book these out, you know, weeks in advance. I, and so I like know what episodes are coming in advance or like who's coming on. And sometimes it's so hard because I'm just like, why can't it be this weekend? Why can't it just be today? <laughs> Can we just do two back to back? I just want Nick yeah. or Zach on right away. <laughs> and, and honestly, uh, this was one I was really excited uh, to get you on for and to chat with you about your story and also just congratulate you on winning the the SKO of what two weeks ago one week it was like a week or two ago uh, yeah like a week or two ago. thank you by the way I appreciate it dude that was hype how was that how'd that feel uh it felt awesome <laughs> that's my first dub in five and a half years so. actually no way <laughs> yeah uh, I haven't won since MKO 2015 but it felt great I mean it felt a little off because I mean I don't know if you watched the final but it was me and Johnny and like his phone died on the final trick and we had to wait for him <laughs> and then when I was doing the final trick, uh, when Josh called it, and I was in the middle of doing my trick, my my screen went like you know ten percent battery left, mm-hmm. and it blacked out my camera. So, but I got the trick. But I got the trick, and I was like, I turned my, and I was like, oh my gosh! Like as soon as I got it, I saw my screen black out. I'm like, no, no. I was like, so oh did you have God. to redo it? I actually, so admittedly, I actually missed SKO. I was out snowboarding with some of my old roommates out in the mountains here, and so I actually missed the the event entirely. But oh, okay, uh, did you have to redo the trick? I did not. Josh said he heard it. Um, I know it's sketchy. Um, I mean, I swear, I totally did it. I, I totally definitely did it. But um. <laughs> But it just felt a little off because all those technical complications at yeah. the end. Um, but it was it still felt good to win, though. Uh, def- definitely felt amazing <laughs> yeah. to win. Did you, did you get a lot of DMs from people saying that was sketch or anyone just <laughs> calling out controversy in the chat um, or anything like that? Um, I mean, p- some people DM me and gave me a little, gave me a little, like, give me some crap about it. Be like, oh man, you need to like prove that last trick. And I was like, ah, like I know, but I swear I got it. You know. <laughs> I yeah, I did it. you probably had some grace there because you were up against Johnny, right, in the finals? Yeah. And so you and Johnny obviously know each other super well, both mm-hmm. on the same team. You guys are good friends. Obviously, there's a level of trust there that goes deeper than, than you know, two guys that just showed totally. up to an event, right? Totally. It's a little deeper than that. Yeah. Dude, right on. Hey, well, man, we are super excited to get you on here. We got a ton of questions that came in ahead of time, and I got a lot of questions myself that I want to dive into. But before we do, I always like to ask a couple, you know, introductory questions, yeah. get the ball rolling. And the first one I always like to ask is, what are you drinking today? Drinking water. I'm not a coffee drinker, unfortunately. And that's okay. You're welcome. You. <laughs> um, but yeah, just mainly just drink water. Um, See, so yeah, I got my little water bar right here with the are you, would you, hey, look at that. Is that your mod on there? Oh, my goodness. Yep. <laughs> where's, uh, where's Nick's mod? Everybody keeps asking, why, why haven't you done any tricks with Nick's mod? Where's his mod on your water bottle? <laughs> oh, my Nick, Nick. Nick's mod isn't on here. But, dude, I, I use Nick's mod for the entire thing of 28. Like, I use it for uh, <laughs> so many tricks. So I got it yeah. covered there. Uh, good, good. Um, so are, are you a pretty health-conscious guy? You're drinking a lot of water. Uh, are you, would you consider yourself a pretty health, health-conscious guy? Yeah, yeah. No, um, definitely... I'd say I'm definitely more health conscious uh, than I was a couple years ago, like before I entered college. I know that's usually when people like kind of flip the switch and go the other direction. But for me, um, I just feel a background. I guess um, my mom has always been like, for the long, as long as I can remember, like gluten free, dairy free, because she has a really severe intolerance for those. So mm. I think she just started like working that into um, um, stuff like that me and my brother ate. And not to say that like eating gluten free and dairy free is uh, uh, like unhealthy. I mean, 
not say that dairy and gluten are like unhealthy or anything, but like mm -hmm. I'm just saying like she kind of put me on to like eating like I guess more stuff that wouldn't irritate me as much. And then mm -hmm. and when I entered college, like I just kind of took an interest in uh, kind of just maintaining and being more health conscious just because uh, I just noticed myself. Um, I noticed myself I could like, really get sluggish if I ate a ton of junk food. I mean, for mm -hmm. instance, I used to eat, I used to work at a candy store with um oh my god, <laughs> that's and Tran and uh, Nick yeah, and that's my like brother. the epitome of not being able to be healthy. <laughs> yeah, no, I ate, I worked at a candy store in like in my senior year of high school for a couple of months, and I would eat candy. I ate eight hour shift, and I just eat all the time because I could just grab whatever I want there and eat it. And like, <laughs> I remember at the end of my end of my time there, I was like, I feel terrible. Like, <laughs> I just feel terrible all the time. Like, I, I used to finally <laughs> catch it up to me. Like, I just feel so bad. You know? I, I um, used to, I used to work in a butcher shop and we would make our own like beef jerky, pork jerky, stuff like that. And oh my gosh, that was like, that was torture in the best of yeah. ways for me possible. Cause like <laughs> when you're on work and you're just like slicing deli meat, you're like, ah, I can have a piece of this, you know, yeah, just a little oh, bit. I can just have another one. Next thing you yeah. know, you're like, oh, we didn't slice enough for the customers. I apparently <laughs> ate too much. I guess I got to go and get some more. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. What, um, what was your favorite candy uh, working at the candy store? Okay, so lo lollipops is like apparently known for <laughs> the candy store name. I don't know lollipops. if this is the 50 cent reference or, or what is this, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was lollipops is the candy store name. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're super known for our gummy bears and like. Yeah, their sour gummy bears are fire. Like, they're so good. <laughs> all these different flavors. So, yeah, definitely the sour gummy bears I would always snack on. And, yeah, right they on. killed me. So. Right on, right on. Hey, well, before we dive into the second question, I'm just, I'm just holding in laughs like crazy right now. There's a ton of people in the chat uh, commenting on, on your, your style right now. You've dressed very formal for our, our interview today. Uh, those that are watching spot on, listening on Spotify or the Apple podcast wouldn't be able to see this, but you got a nice button-up shirt. Hair's looking great. <laughs> It's all formal. Uh, we got some comments saying you're ready to, to teach us some philosophy or, or uh, physics. We got for Elise in the chat, you know, going to teach us some piano lessons. This is a formal gig today. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, I just looked at my closet. I was like, well, better uh, look as on point as I can for this, you know, preview. Yeah, absolutely. I, the, I saw the shirt and I was like, all right, I'm just going to wear that. I love it. I absolutely love it. So shout out to Professor Zach today <laughs> oh in, in the preview. Uh, the, the people love it. Okay, Zach, um, I want to know uh, if you could teach any one person their first spike, past or present, who would it be? It doesn't have to be someone who's played Dom or, or, or has. Uh, who would you want to teach? Um, yeah. I think I I knew you were gonna ask this question. I didn't think about it. Um, I'd say okay. So I see I see play soccer a lot. Uh, so I'd say probably. I mean, everybody knows or most people know Ronaldo. Probably mm -hmm. that guy's super famous, um, and he's like one of the greatest uh, soccer players of all time. So probably him. Yeah, mm. Ronaldo. Do you do you watch uh, like the what is it MLS? Is that what it's called? Major League Soccer. Yeah, MLS. Uh, I don't keep up with soccer anymore. Uh, yeah. I stopped playing soccer like a. Uh, one two three like four years ago uh four years ago and then i just stopped following it too so but um yeah that's fair did you did you play in college did you go to college to play uh no 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 no, no okay. i uh i'm saying university of washington just just like general you know just general admittance like okay, nothing yeah just regular. Hey, right yeah. on. I, no, neither did i played like so i went to a small a small college basically like a small liberal arts kind of like community college and i played on their their soccer team for one year oh, nice. it was a blast i loved it uh, but it definitely wasn't like we were playing like, oh, yeah, super competitive scholarships, stuff like that. Not mm -hmm. at all. I just loved it. and It was a good time. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, I want to know before we dive in uh, to really the meat of our conversation here today, uh, who is the most inspiring player for you today? Uh, not the person who inspired you to start or anything like that. But like right now, who do you look up to the most? Um, you know, a couple players a flash through my mind thinking about the answer to this question just now, but, but they're all like the past. Um, I'd say right now, nope. I don't know. If, uh, I guess I can name a couple players, but mainly, I mean, I'm around my brother all the time and everybody who plays Konami knows Nick is one of the greatest players, if not debatably the greatest player in the game. And I see him do tricks all the time. And it's just, um, and I, when I see the stuff he does, I'm like, I just get inspired to, you know, try the types of tricks mm -hmm. he's doing. Um, and kind of level up my game that way. So I've been noticing that in my play a lot recently. So I'd say Nick um, right now. Yeah. Was that always the case? Or did you ever, were you pretty competitive with your brother? And like, what, what did that relationship look like for you on your side of that relationship? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, yeah. So a lot of people ask, uh, 
some people have asked me, I know, I know Johnny put this in the quotes in your post yeah. uh, as a joke, um, but a lot of people ask me, I'd be like, oh, what does it feel like to be the, the goat's brother? Um, I don't know if people realize that we were brothers before Kendama, so it's still regular. <laughs> like, you know, uh, um, it's like you, did, you only became his brother after, after yeah, no, like, a bunch of championships. No, we've been brothers a uh, whole life, so I mean, uh, natural competitiveness we've always had, I think. Uh, I think that's in part of why I've become, um, I mean, that's how I feel like how I progressed. I saw me a lot progress a lot just because he was there, like whether I was conscious of it or not, like pushing me and vice versa to him. So um, there's that. And then my side of the relationship with, um, did you ask what was, how it was on my side of being the, with the whole competitiveness of that? Or? Yeah. I'm more curious, like, was it a positive competition or did you ever run into that? Like, I, I know some people will like, will fight with their brothers or sister or whatever it is. It's like when they're getting competitive, it's not healthy. It's actually like negative and mm -hmm. it can cause division. Was that something that brought you guys closer together or something that pushed you guys apart at times? Or did it kind of fluctuate between the two? Um, I'd say that, okay, so definitely never- We're, di we're diving right in here. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. No, let's do it. I, I want to talk about this too. Um, so it wasn't ever negative until, or I mean, I don't want to say it was like super negative at any point, but it was, it was always positive, um, especially in my first, I don't know, like for the entire entirety of my Kendama career, like we're all, we're never on like bad terms. We've never been on bad terms because of Kendama. Um, hmm. We've always uh, been there. Like if, if like he gets a trick or I get a trick, uh, and the person doesn't land, like we'll give each other like crap about it. And that, but that will like inadvertently like, you know, make us push each other even further. I'd say though, um, around, you know, 2017 and the 2017, 2018, Nick won literally every Kendama competition. Yeah. He it was an in. insane year for him amazing um and even in 2019 he won a great majority of the comps he was at um but um so during that time i actually did go through a little i didn't a negativity in myself because i mean i'm at there at these events too and when i see my brother winning literally every single competition you know it just made me feel like oh man like i, I just suck like i just suck mm -hmm. um and and like it just it just i felt that way because i mean winning one competition is insane right like winning yeah. one competition is so crazy a lot of people um are just trying to get one win right dude has like 30 wins <laughs> okay dude has yeah. like literally 30 wins something it's like crazy that. something crazy like that um so i did go through a period there where i was um interpreting his success um and letting it affect me negatively uh, uh like kind of like mentally and like just my inner self like a negative self-talk um a lot but uh, in the past year or two, I've learned to turn that around and kind of just have a completely different perspective on it. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that he's so good and like does really well in all these competitions, I can't help but think that I'm I'm inspired by it. And then I'm actually, you know, I'm actually lucky to have that um, him so close to me, like such an amazing player, so close to me, and I uh, get to see him play and play with him every single day because that just that's a, it's a constant reminder that I can get better. Um, uh, no matter how uh, you know skilled I get, there's always another level, and yeah. I think that's good because I mean, if he wasn't there and I was, um, you know, progressing at the same rate I am now without him, you know, there's a good chance my attitude toward Kendama would be completely different. I could be, you know, cockier, more self-absorbed, um, all of that. And but if I didn't have a constant reminder of someone in front of me who's, you know, better than me and like just a great player, then I wouldn't be who I am today. So I think. Um, in Kendama, I think overall, the whole scope of the competitiveness, I think it's done, uh, it's helped build me into uh, uh, to, to the person I am today because of that, my competitiveness with Nick. Yeah, totally. What So during that like season where you, you found that to be kind of a negative influence for you, where you, you felt like maybe you were in the shadows a little bit yeah. of, of your brother, what was your response there? Did you did you play less Kendama or were you more inspired to like try and get better at Kendama? Were you frustrated with your brother or frustrated with yourself? Like what were some of the emotional things that you were going through there? Um, I wasn't playing less Kendama. I'd say, I'd say, well, I wasn't playing less Kendama because of Nick, um, I did go through a phase where Fortnite came out, and I was like, "All right, like, <laughs> we we all have okay, that phase for like time. I'm hopping on after school, okay? Like I'm going on for a couple hours after school." Nick never played Fortnite, okay? This is why I think he's so good. Okay? <laughs> Every hour that I play Fortnite for like four month period, dude, Nick was in the other room just seshing hard, and I was like, "Okay, dude, you don't want to like go snipe these people with me, like." <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get hey. a fat dub uh, no but no i never felt uh, so basically with, during that time emotionally for me um i did as i, as I mentioned earlier like just kind of ne negative toward myself like i would just mm -hmm. be like 
I just suck at Kanama. Um, I just be like, sometimes I'd be like, I go to bed and be like, after Sashi with Nick, I'm like, man, like that trick he was doing just, just unconsciously was just super hard. And I was like, that suck. Anyways, I'm going to bed. All right. <laughs> um, no, but um, uh, yeah, emotionally, I was just kind of like, oh man. But oh, in the end of the day, though, like I got over it. Um, as I said, I grew out of that um, and changed my mm-hmm. mindset. So yeah, totally. That's super cool that, that like you can see that now in hindsight into where you are today. I, I am curious. I don't want to rest on this like too, too long by any means, mm-hmm. but I think there's a lot of value here for people listening in terms of like the mindsets that I think so many people have in Kendama, which I think just like kills people and beats people up so often, you know, they, they may start playing alongside someone else at the same time because you and your brother started pretty close to the same time. And we'll jump yeah. into that story a bit, but totally. And and I see it all the time where like two people start, but they progress at different rates or, you know, they're competitive. And then one person, you know, maybe wins more than the other. And that like really beats up on the other guy and they can feel like they're living in the shadow of that other person all the time. And, and that can just corrupt you, right? That can, that can get deep down inside you and just mm-hmm. eat you from the inside out. And it can tell you all sorts of things about yourself that, that aren't true. Yeah. And, and there's like two ways to respond to that, right? There's like, okay, wait, hold on. Let me take a step back and put my ego aside for a minute and say like, wait, who is this person? This is my friend. This is my mm-hmm. brother in your case. And it's like, yeah. this is another guy who genuinely loves this game. Like I love this game. It's not really about who's better than one another, but we both get to progress. Like when you take the step back and realize that Kanam is a tool for ourselves to progress mm-hmm. ourselves more than just playing Bologna, that, that changes everything, right? Totally. And, and that, that's what it's about. Yeah. Obviously, and competition's I, good, but. Yeah. And I want to say something on that too. I see a lot of people on Instagram nowadays, um, kind of in their tricks, like, in the captions saying, like, oh, like, I know this isn't a banger, but, you know, blah, 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 whatever. Um, all stuff along that lines. And I just want to say, like, okay, at the end of the day, there's always going to be someone, you know, better better than you, Kanama, and that's totally fine, okay? I know social media is, social media is a great tool, but it also is a, is a tool that we use that, you know, may get inside our heads negatively. Oh, when we every see, day. You know, an amazing, like, a, a crazy, crazy trick. And, you know, we're over here doing, like, the the most middle school version of that trick or can't even do that. So, but it, you know, it's fine that that's even a thing because, you know, cannot, everybody's progressing in Kendama, but mm-hmm. I just want to run, run this point home is that if it's challenging for you and you used to not be able to do that trick, but now, now you can do it. That's a win. Like that's yeah. a win. You're, you, you practice hard to do this trick and now you can do that trick. That's yeah. a win. You should feel great about yourself. Not to, and, and not to say that you should completely ignore everybody out there in social media, because I think those people out there can be looked at as a source of inspiration. But I just want to say that, like, yeah, if you can do a trick now that you couldn't do, like, miss, a week ago, a month mm-hmm. ago, a year ago, that's amazing. Like, you're, you're progressing, and that's all we can you're really do. You're progressing for, at you know? a game that is incredibly difficult to play. Yeah. It's like, yeah. this is not an easy game. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, hopefully it's crazy. you're progressing, and then, and then you're having fun with it, too. And that's pretty much all Kanama you know, should be based around. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I got one more question kind of on this vein of topic before we jump into your story, we kind of like dove ahead into the future, but I, I will, we'll take it back here in a minute, but I want to know how did, how did that season of your life impact your relationships with people in the community? Cause my, my assumption, and you can totally, totally correct me is I think perceptually from the outside, people would see you and, and Nick in, in a package of sorts where they're like, Oh, it's Nick and Zach. Yep. And so you would often, you know, travel around to events together. I remember watching those old videos of you and your brother with your, your blonde hair in the, in the sweet sh- in the, in the oh, shops yeah. around traveling to events and, oh, and you guys were like a package deal all the time. But yeah. as you progressed and as you got deeper into it, you were both sponsored, all these things. How did that affect your relationships with the community? Uh, and what was that like for you? And yeah, your you're just talking about, you're just talking about generally through Kinama, right? Like, yeah. Gen- yeah. Okay. So like, you know, like in friendships, was your friendships with other people through Nick or through you, or was it a together friendship? What did that look like for you in the community? Um, well, yeah. So I think a lot of people, you know, I don't particularly like prefer being looked at as a package deal with Nick, but I, mm-hmm. in Kenama, but I totally understand it. Cause when me and Nick came up in Kenama together, like we came up into Kenama, like playing with each other every day, you know, getting sponsored at the same time on the same team. Um, and we also, and I'm lucky that Nick and I have an amazing relationship with each other. We're each mm-hmm. other's, um, like, he's my best friend. Um, I think he would say the same about me. And, like, so we really enjoy hanging out with each other at the end of the day. So I don't think any friendships came exclusively through Nick to me. Mm-hmm. I honestly think that since Nick and I hang out with each other so often at Kanama events, we just become friends with, this, like, relatively mm-hmm. the same people at the same time. Um, 
Although, I mean, I'm sure that I was friends with the person in Kanama first, uh, and vice versa with Nick. Like, we have our own, we had our own individual friends. We kind of like brought mm-hmm. them together. Like, um, do you guys have your own communities like separate from each other within the Kanama world, or or oh, like no. like group chats that you guys are both in different groups of people that you hang out with? I don't think so. I mean, yeah. I, I don't think so. I think Nick and I are definitely friends. Like, if we're in group chats with somebody, I think uh, we're pretty good friends with them, mm-hmm. and we're all in those same group chats. Like, um, so I don't think. Yeah, I don't think I'm in a. I'm definitely not in a subsection subsection of a community that Nick's not. Um, but yeah, that just goes back to saying like yeah. me and Nick hang out with each other all the time at Kanama events, and then so we will usually hang out with the same people. Uh, yeah, 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 totally. That's cool. Okay, uh, t- take me back in time. We'll 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 journey through some of your story. I want to get to know you here. I want to get to know you know what what drives Nick. What gets you up? In- oh, Zach. Oh my gosh, I keep seeing Nick <laughs> in good. the chat all day long. Yeah, no, it's and it's like good. everybody keeps saying Nick. <laughs> The amount of All jokes good. at the first minute was yeah. like, oh, is this Nick on here? Yeah, you know, I saw those too. <laughs> I like hesitated so much. I was like, it's Zach, it's Zach, it's Zach. Yeah, yeah. Zach, <laughs> uh, take me back in time to pre-Dama. Uh, what were you doing? Uh, how old were you before Kendama? <laughs> like, when did you first pick it up? Okay, so if, when I first picked up Kendama, I was 11. I was in sixth grade, um, and it was a huge fad of my school. But before that, I'd say I was really into, um, I guess my main hobbies were just soccer <laughs> i just played soccer yeah. um a lot um i just play i played soccer when i started i started playing when i was five and then yeah 11 that through five through 11 that's pretty much like my main thing um yeah. and then i got into kendama do you want me to dive into how i got into kendama here we'll, we'll get there in a second talk, talk <laughs> okay. about family life obviously we know nick do you have other siblings yeah uh no uh i just have it's just me nick and then my mom and dad um and what do your parents then, do what do my parents do? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my mom's in insurance and then my dad is in uh, like a transportation, transportation services. Cool. I, w- I wish I could give you like titles, <laughs> job titles, but I literally <laughs> like, I couldn't give you an accurate job title. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Uh, were, were your parents pretty involved in your guys' life growing up? I, I think like, you know, as a smaller family, I just always assume that parents are super close to their kids in smaller families. I grew up in a family of like four and so, you know, and, and our family had a whole, bu- whole bunch of stuff going on that, yeah. you know, I was kind of close with my parents, not super close, kind of close with my siblings, not super close. But were you guys really close with your parents? Yeah, so I, w- I was really close to my parents growing up. Um, I think my parents uh, made a huge effort to, you know, stay like connected me. And I looking back on that now that I'm 20, like, I really, really appreciate that. Like, my parents are awesome. They've done so much for me. And they've provided me so many opportunities. And I think the biggest thing they've done for me was um, just kind of just letting me be who I am, you know, support, providing me support through whatever, like, choices I made. Obviously, if I'm doing, like, immoral, like, doing immoral things, like, they're going to, you know, step in. But, you know, yeah, yeah. supporting me. I mean, going back to the mohawk, right? Like, I was nine. I was like, I literally came to my mom <laughs> yeah. one day and I was like, when yeah, I, can I, I get a mohawk, parent, please? I'm not doing, I'm not letting my kid do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Like, I was like, yeah, mom, can I get a mohawk, please? And I was like, I'm, not, I'm nine. <laughs> And she said, and then this is one example, but she was like, yeah. And then she made it happen for me. And she like, it took, whenever I had to re-bleach that, two hours, by the way, two hours, <laughs> two hours out of my mom's day to help me do that. Okay. And the thing is, shout I out to that, the moms. Seriously, my mom and dad definitely helped me do that. And then I had that mohawk. I didn't, I just didn't decide to ha- like shave it off until I was like 13, 13 or 14. So I had it for like from ages nine or eight. I got in third grade, so I was eight or eight or nine to like age 13. So I had it for a long time, way past the point where, and it looked <laughs> terrible. I didn't even spike it up anymore after one year. It was so bad. And, and so, yeah, they didn't say anything about it. They never, I don't think they ever told me that I should just shave it. They just were like, all right, he still wants it. Okay, cool. He can, he's just going to keep rolling with it until he feels like not. And then, um, just, uh, and it's for Kendama too. Like my mom and dad have always been super, super, super supportive of me playing Kendama, um, which I really appreciate. Mm-hmm. It's a, I know it's a, a Kanama is a totally, uh, you know, untraditional hobby to have, of course. It's so niche and so, I mean, it's so big now, but back then it was even, you know, small. It was super small back when I started, when I was 11, like, but they were just nonstop support all the time. And I just can't thank them enough for that. So, yeah, my parents have been super close to me and um, yeah. Yeah, that's sweet. Okay, so so talk us through a little bit of how you got into Kanama then. So you're, you're <clears> in like sixth grade, 11 years old. And yeah. how does Kanama enter into the world of Zach Gallagher? Yeah. Okay. So Kendama in Washington in around 2011, 2012, it blew up. I swear everybody within like 
<laughs> like a 10 mile radius of me had one i know in seattle it's popping off too i'm from still me it's 45 minutes east from seattle okay um but um yeah so it was a huge fad at my middle school everybody had it like everybody in my sixth grade class had at least one um and i looked at it at first i blew up in the it started sixth grade so september and i looked at mm-hmm. it first i'm like well, that's dumb. You know, that's a typical, yeah, yeah. like that's a typical response. That that's like people. the typical response of anyone who's good at Kanama now, you know, it's like <laughs> th- their whole story is like, yeah, I saw it. It looked dumb. And now look where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> no, I it, was the same, so- same, it was the same for me. Right. Like that's how I got into that. My, my buddy showed me and I was like, ah, that looks easy. Yeah. Right? He's like, no, 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 just try it. And I was like, I don't know. Yeah. And then when you try it, it's like, you know, it's like, yeah, it's insane. So yeah, when I tried it, when I actually did big cup for the first time, like, <laughs> Oh my God, like, this is yeah. crazy so i played um i remember the first time i really went at it and i literally just went over to my friend's house um and they were actually i went over to yeah my friend's house and they were another pair of twins uh actually they're fraternal twins uh, michael and dominic Vrana, shout out um but i played Konama there for like two hours two and a half hours straight and i was like okay i need one this is like five m- months after i've known about it mm-hmm. by the way this is like september to so January. You, you delayed your start did you play with anyone's at school or anything like that or did you just like like i ain't touching that thing no, I just, I don't, I just remember like not touching it. Like I was like, really? oh, that's stupid. Uh, but yeah, in January of two, uh, yeah, 2012, I was like, all right, I'm going to get on this. Um, so after I went to my friend's Michael Nomic's house, I came home. I remember my mom picking me up and I was like, mom, please give me a Kanama. Like, please give me a Kanama, please. Uh, and it's luckily, you know, fortunately enough, she did. I got a light blue Azora from Kendama USA. Um, fun fact, my first five Kendamas were blue. I thought that was sick. I was like, I'm only getting blue Kendamas. Like, yeah. Zach, branch out, dude. You know, <laughs> get a different color. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so hey, that's how I, I got introduced. Hey, what a, what a mom, you know, lets you get a mohawk. <laughs> says hey i want a kendama Seriously. here's a kendama mom just keeps giving it giving it yeah to she just she was like oh you want that all right cool and then i remember when i started playing with it for the first time she wanted to see like how it worked i think i like, hit myself on the head and she's like do you need a helmet for that and I'm like i don't <laughs> think so like, i would have loved to see one of those like helmets you know those like helmets that those like punk rock kids wear they yeah the like mohawks coming out the back and you're like yep. what parent lets their kid wear that i don't know <laughs> and it's like that's the kid that gets bullied at the at the like skate park too and yeah you're like, oh come Come on, like, oh, man. he's just out here trying to have fun guys <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man okay so so you got into kendama mom mom got you dama at the same time was this did did your mom also just get one for for nick at this time as well she's like if uh, i get yeah. one for zach i gotta get one for nick sort of thing but did you and yeah because we were at the we we're actually there together at the house uh, um because yeah we're both me and nick were both friends with these of oh, these two people yeah. so yeah we both went over for like to play ping pong or something and then we just end up playing kendama each other night so Hey, right on, right on. Yeah. Hey, pr- it's pretty similar. Do you like ever, okay, so I a mean, little side thing, but like I, I feel like every canola player has this habit. It's like if you ever have anything in a ball, it's like you're just like doing tricks with it, whatever it is, a ping pong paddle in a ball, you know, it could be whatever it is. And you're just like trying to do like border balance with your fingers. Yeah. Dude, I like can't not do that to the point where it scares me when people like pass me their child. I'm oh, like, no, you're going to start like border balancing <laughs> oh, yeah, this like, kid. Like, <laughs> you're like, what do I do with this? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny hopefully oh, you ever drop it though <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm like i'm like trying to learn how to do like 360 shove it's with my niece right now you know toss her up in the air spinner <laughs> oh man that's so i'm just dang. kidding so i'm sick. kidding <laughs> <laughs> okay so so you got into kanama you're like 11 11 years old grade six uh what are some of the early steps that kind of start pushing you in a direction because it wasn't long after that that you're showing up in videos in like kids toy stores playing dama with professionals how how did that all escalate and scale for you yeah that's a great question bringing me to back down memory lane real quick um so i when i first started kanama as i said it was a huge fad i had a ton of people to play with I, all my close friends are into it so we played every day after school i remember that summer 2012 i played like probably every day for like four to six hours a day like it was insane all it's all we would do um and so I remember at the end of 2012, this is my first Kanama trip I took. Um, I hopped. My friend's dad was super, super nice. And then he brought us all down to Wenatchee. Do you know WKT? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Uh, was that uh, Keith Matsumura? Uh, yep, down- Keith, yeah. Matt Ballard, um, yeah. Nick Mayo, all those people. Uh, and they had a, that's when the premiere of Where We Are was actually being held. Oh, so yeah. they premiered it in a theater. So I went down there with my friends um, to, you know, see the see the live premiere and also enter that little competition that they had they had a little yeah. competition beforehand which is great um and that was like my first real dom trip and i think that's what really kind of sparked me to like just sparked a new stoke on kendama for me because i remember after that i was just all just everything like 
all signals, you know, go towards Kendama. Uh, I ended up <laughs> actually ended up winning <laughs> like the intermediate speed ladder for that one. That was crazy for me, by the way. It was in front of a theater, and I'm like this. I'm like I'm a 12 year old kid. You okay, know? hold up for one second though. Like you were in a theater for a Kendama premiere. That's like mind blowing to me. First off, yeah, that that even ever happened anywhere. Yep. That there was a a Kendama film or edit or whatever it was played in a theater. Like no, yeah, it was that's crazy to today's standards. It's like how does that, that doesn't happen anymore. No. No, it was amazing. I cannot believe like that was an amazing experience for me. I swear it like put me on to a whole new level of like interest in Kendama. So yeah. yeah, after going to that trip with my friends, I was like obviously okay, I think when everybody goes on a Kendama trip, they feel like an elevation in their um mm, yeah. interest and inspiration oh, yeah. for Kendama. And I just had a crazy new inspiration. So um yeah, twenty thirteen came and then I started playing uh probably even more than I uh recently had. And so Another event in 2013 that I distinctly remember was um, it was Battle in Seattle. Battle in Seattle 2013, that was the second to last one they had. And I just remember, you know, I'm there with the Mohawk again. I'm playing a ton of Kendama all the time. That event too, like, that's when I first started, I think, showing up in videos of, like, other people. Because, I mean, that event too, I think I got to the end. I got, I was into the advanced speed ladder in that time, and I ended up getting second to Nick. That was a, that was an amazing competition. Um, but yeah, was that those? Who hosted the battle in Seattle? Yeah, so um, he's not in the scene anymore, but the host was Gus Carstens. He was a pro for okay. Kendamico. So okay, um, right back in the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so Gus Carstens hosted those. And I know other people helped out too, but, um, but yeah, mainly it, was, mainly it was Gus. So yeah, after that, 2013, then then I'm like really getting into Kendama at this point. Uh, I go to battle in Seattle. I went to Wenatchee again because they did a whole tour, Ken Garden Ridge tour back then. Um, they went through like the West Coast from California through Oregon to went mm-hmm. to Washington. And they stopped in Wenatchee before Battle in Seattle. So I went to Wenatchee again. Then like the next week was Battle in Seattle. <clears throat> and it was crazy. So that was a huge another huge moment for me where I was like, wow, like this community is so awesome. I had so much fun at these events. It was one some of the best times of my life. Carrying that out another year. It's twenty fourteen. And the early twenty fourteen days, uh, I'm still playing a ton of Kendama and then um I'm, there's this group in Facebook called Domadare. I think Brian Hansen created it. Um, and it was pretty much where you just ask for tricks. Be like, hey, give me a Domadare. And people just like, Wait, give you Bri- a trick to do. Brian Hansen. <laughs> what, I recognize that name. Where? Who is Brian Hansen? <clears throat> oh, this is going to be funny. Um, <laughs> so what, what's his IG handle? Hold on. I think I, think I know who this is. Nah, I think and you know. You and it's know. really funny. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we're not supposed to talk about it. Nah, I don't know if we should. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, everybody knows Ryan Hant. Probably in the chat, you can just look him up and just see what you find, I guess. But I mean, whatever. He doesn't really play Konami much anymore. Anyways, yeah, he created that group, and then so I was, I was literally after school every day. I'd ask for dares in that group, and I'd be like, "Okay, guys, give me a Dom and dare." I get like thirty comments. I'd just be posting video after video after video in this Facebook group for months and months on end. And come to find out later, I think that's how I got like initially noticed by Sweets because they just noticed like I was just posting an, a ton in this group um just i mean that progressed me so much too just i was trying tricks for hours after school that i couldn't do and then eventually could just do could get them after uh hours of practice so i put those out and then tacoma takeover came um met sweets for the first time and willie uh willie p that was great and then bound seattle this is when okay this is when i got sponsored i'm gonna end the story here yeah, yeah. this timeline um bound seattle like, like a month before the last bound seattle 2014 i got a message from sweets and he's asking me to be on the team and that okay that's when like the full stoke level that i was kind of talking on the earlier things that come from events that's mm-hmm. when it just like skyrocketed because i never thought i'd be like sponsored player for kendama you know when i first started obviously i was like 11 when i started so um it was just crazy for me yeah. and honestly talking about this i literally forgot the question you asked <laughs> i don't even know why i'm talking about this right just... now um <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just end it here. So yeah, that happened in 2014 Battle in Seattle. That was my first event going in as a pro. And then I guess the rest is history, like traveling to events because of Sweets. Uh, Got to shout out Sweets. Thank you so much for mm-hmm. everything you've done for me, all the opportunities you've given me. And But so, yeah, well, that was just kind of my initial two-year journey through Kenosha. Yeah, so that was that was in what year again, did you say you were spon- sponsored? 2014. That was June 2014. I think Battle in Seattle was in August 2014. That was the last one. Yeah, what, with your sponsorship, I can't remember. Were you added directly onto the pro team right away? You uh, No. So Sweets had a, Sweets had a different team uh, name for it back then. It's called the Homegrown Team. 
Yeah. I know we don't we don't promote that name anymore because we don't really have team names anymore. It's like it's you're just on a the sweet uh, team. yeah, just the sweet team. Like uh or uh and then like I guess the pros have a pro model, but we're all like technically pro, right? Because we're sponsored. Um um, but yeah, back then there, uh, it was the pro team and the homegrown team. And then I was put on the homegrown team. There was another team too, wasn't there? There was. Yeah. So in 2015, we added a, a team that was, I guess I'm doing tiers because I think yeah. this is basically how they were. So it was pro homegrown in 2015, we had a sponsorship contest and we added the focus team. The fo- That's what it was. Yeah. So I was added on the homegrown team at first. I just like got a Facebook message from Sweets and then. Yeah, it's got added. So it was amazing. It was amazing. That's that's so cool. So at that time, was it both you and Nick approached for the homegrown team? Uh, yeah. And though that's so that's so cool. So Battle in Seattle was the first time you actually competed. How did you do at that competition with the sponsor title behind you? Yeah, that was um, <clears throat> yeah, that was um, I think I did I did pretty good. I did pretty good for my first competition in a pro bracket. So I actually got top eight. Um, which was I didn't expect to make it that far at all. I think I'd be like three or four people, but um, <laughs> I just remember going against uh, Keith in the first round. Like Keith, I idolized him for my entire life, and Dude, I'm going against all, him now. We all like, idolized <laughs> Keith. One of the one of my favorite players of all time. Love that guy. Keith is an amazing person. He did he did a lot for Konami back in the day, just providing inspiration and pushing the game in general. Um, but it was crazy for me, like um, going against him and. Uh, I played Stodd for the first time in that event too, so that was that was awesome. But yeah, I got top eight, so I did I did pretty good for my standards. I mean, I didn't really have an expectation for myself mm-hmm. back then, but I lost to Sam Cannon, and then uh, he ended up winning the whole thing, so couldn't pick a better person to lose to. Um, yeah, that that know. always feels nice. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it always feels good. It's like you know, you like logic to yourself. Oh, I lost to the guy who won it, so I basically came second place. Yeah, it's like okay, like if I didn't compete against him, like. <laughs> I probably, won't. probably won't. no. That's not what I thought. But like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So okay, man. You you lived like the dream that so many of us in Kenama really wish that we could have lived. Like you talk about these stories and meeting like Nick Stodd, like it's nothing. And and there's so many of us that have lived vicariously through these vlogs, through the the Norks uh, world and the Sweets yep. life and the Kusa vlogs and stuff. And you're like in all of these vlogs with your brother, and you're just interacting with these people. Did did that ever feel surreal to you? Because for, for me, like, I, I'm from Canada. I was living in a small town. I hadn't met a single other Dama player, aside from maybe, like, two people, until I finally went to MKO after having played Kanama for about three years. Uh, and, and for you, you just, like, were right integrated into the community from the get-go. What, did, what was that like? Did that feel real to you? Uh, no. It, well, okay. So my first couple of events, like, back when I first started playing first two, three years, like whenever I go to an event, I feel this like energy, right? Like, Oh my gosh, I'm at a Kendama event. Like I get like skins tingling. Like this is so amazing. So that's the realness of a Kendama event definitely didn't fade away until I ended up going on, you know, multiple Kendama events trips per year. But um, Mm -hmm. it always feels surreal in the moment. Um, I mean, whenever, not in the moment, I guess, because after so many trips, I kind of just get used to that feeling. But when I reflect on it, it's like, Oh my gosh, I went across the country to, for a for a toy you know for a kendama event <laughs> that's crazy that's absolutely crazy so when and especially now in covid times like now i'm reflecting back on it it always yeah. feels it's my entire journey through kendama has been surreal because as i mentioned like when i was 12 never in my life would i thought of i'd be you know sponsored for this or given these opportunities to go uh, across the country across the world strictly for you know kendama that's insane to me so when i reflect on it it is it is still really surreal yeah, that's crazy. So who were some of the early influences for you in that journey that we would still know today as some of the like key moments or the key people that you met that started to like really flip the switch for you to say, oh, this is like a, a part of my life that I want to begin identifying with more more deeply? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think, I think, well, I think the time period when that really happened was, I mean, I never really, I always identified with Kinama when I started playing with it because I was all, mm-hmm. I was, I felt like I was super interested uh, whenever I got in. So I never like uh, hid that identity for myself. But when I first started like, uh, I think forming myself like consciously like a- around Kendama was when I started going across the country for trips. So that was mm. after uh, getting sponsored by Sweets and like, I guess going to Seattle and then uh, going to uh, Minnesota for that first MKO in 2014. Um, but yeah, when I met the Sweets team for the first time at like, yeah, we were, a lot of us were there for the first MKO. It was crazy. I'm like, Sweets, B. Meyer. Um, I already knew Max Norcross uh, beforehand, but that time... He, he's that from was, Seattle, right? Yep, he's from Seattle. So I, I already saw him um, a couple times here and there. It was just small but, um, sauce to you. 
<laughs> no, no, no. Max was, um, yeah, Max is actually one of my biggest inspirations when I started. He, um, he was ahead of the game, like by so by so much back in the day. He would always do crazy tricks at the end of his edits. But, um, anyways, yeah, meeting Swedes just for the first time. All those people back in the day. I can't say all the names back then because I mean, there were, the team was completely different back then. But anyways, um, when I was yeah, meeting Fisher, uh, Stodd, Wyatt. All those people, like dudes, Oregon people, COTK, like those people were great. Being the um the Hawaii homies, like the Hawaii homies in the next year, the following year, twenty fifteen, mm-hmm. like just amazing times. Like those people, um, not not everybody I mentioned, I I'm still close with the, the high majority of them. Like mm-hmm. I'm so I'm still really close with like the Hawaii homies, and then like Stodd and um Fish, I'm pretty close to. But just meeting those people at my first real event, like not I mean not real event, but my first uh out of town event, I'd say yeah, first out of town event just inspired me for forever like just kind of saying like wow we're all here across, from across the country yeah meeting here at the event um just crazy so that that was the same for me when i showed up to mko for the first time like kendama was definitely a part of my life before that and it was definitely a significant piece you know i, I walked around my college campus playing all yeah. the time people knew me for it but you know it always felt like a separate piece of me but then when i finally went to mko for the first time in 2018 i think it was and i rolled in there i was like whoa this is my people. This is yeah. my community. And you're like, you leave and you're like, more and more, you're like, man, it hurts to leave. It sucks. It, it actually feels like you're leaving a bit of yourself behind. It's such a surreal experience uh, to mm-hmm. go to an event. So, I mean, like, man, I can't wait for events to come back. I want to book a flight to the nearest event ASAP. Like, that. that's where I'm at Dude. right now. I'm so pent up. Just yeah. wanting to be around people. I don't even care about competing. I would rather just sleep on someone's couch in their living room just to be with people and jam like that. I'll put, I'll, I'll put the money down right now. Yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. No people. I'm like, it, it's surprising. I mean, it was a, uh, back in the day, it was surprising initially going to Kenama events to see how many people would actually do that. Just be like, all right, I'm sleeping on the floor in this person's room. Yeah. And they, they don't even care. Cause they're at a Kenama event, you know, they, they don't even care. I'm like, that's dedication right there. Like I never yeah. had to do that, but, um, yeah, people are like, yeah, I'm just paying. I'm sleeping in my car, sleeping in the, sleeping in the floor. I'm like, that, let's Dude, go. Like, the commitment <laughs> is crazy. It's like, man, I, I'm sure a, a fair significant percentage of the people in the Kanama community are, are living around the poverty line and, and we'll still sacrifice oh, everything we got to go and just to go to these, events, people, these amazing events. Right? Yeah. It's crazy. We, we got a weird community that does that. And I love the dedication it. Dedication is high. I love it. Hey, let, let's take a minute here. Let's answer some questions from the All chat right. and from the patrons, and then we'll uh, jump back in and let's dive a little bit into the the more modern uh, part of your life you know from your sweet sponsorship to today yeah. you know pro mods i want to chat about the documentary that you and your brother did because i think that was yeah, one of the it. coolest pieces of content that came out in that <laughs> that era of kendama because we hadn't really seen a whole lot like that uh, style of kendama film and now you know i mean i'm pushing for it. i want more documentary more kendama content yeah. on youtube dude <laughs> Trying to get people out there doing it. The Kendama France one. I don't know if you've seen it yet. You got I it. I haven't yet. You need to go watch it. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's, let's hit a couple questions here. A few from the Patreons. First, we got one from Brett Walters, Boston W on Instagram. He wants to know, if you could hire a Hollywood director to direct your next Kendama edit, who would it be? Wow, this question assumes that I know Hollywood directors. <laughs> um, uh, you got like Christopher Nolan. You got Christopher Nolan. You got Christopher Nolan. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, Michael Bay. Michael, that would be epic. Just lots okay, of. I know stories. there's a meme of him always doing explosions, but how sick would that be to land explosions? <laughs> like the entire set blows up behind you. Okay, let's just go with Michael Bay. Since I don't know many. <laughs> Michael Bay, just, Steven Spielberg, you name it. Yeah, let's tons. do that. Absolutely. <laughs> Cool. Um, he also has another question here, and I think you touched a little bit on this, but I think this is a great question. Uh, I really like this one because you've been in the, the game for so long and you've kind of done it both as a kid and now as an adult. Uh, yeah. What is the biggest change that you've seen in Kendama since you've started? Oh, wow. Um, okay. I definitely say the biggest change off the top of my head, besides the trick, uh, trick trends and evolutions and all that that's always going to come um tricks are insanely different now than they were back then i mean the hardest trick i thought when i first started i kid you not i thought the hardest trick in kanama was hand roll the base cup space walk hand roll the base cup i literally thought that was the hardest trick and now of course it's insane i never thought so you that's never a think safety kanama trick can, yeah 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 you never think kanama like i mean like 
back then I never thought Konami could progress any any further because I was like 12 and I didn't really know what I was looking at. Um, mm-hmm. But now look at it now. It's crazy. But other than that, I'd say the biggest thing I see in the community as a whole that's different off, just off, off, off the top of my head here um, is like the mindset. I touched on this uh, at the beginning of this, um, mm-hmm. but how people are always like super intense and super down on themselves to like land the hardest trick of all time and not even just hard for them. They want it to make it hard in the context of everybody else too. Um, mm. So I see that a lot in people's captions now and stuff. And it never was like that back then. Everybody already always um, just, you know, posted whatever they want, challenged themselves. And like, was. Uh, I don't think a lot of comparison, I mean, comparison has always been there, but there's way more uh, kind of negative comparison now than like from, from like people yeah. to other people in the community than there were back then. I mean, I, back then I, <laughs> I was posting domineers like literally on Facebook. Like, I mean, everybody was posting domineers on Facebook that, I mean, other people in the community could obviously easily do. Like, none, mm-hmm. of, none of us, like, back then were, like, you know, doing one-off tricks that only, like, <laughs> like we could do. They weren't, like, just stuff that uh, yeah. nobody else could do, uh, you know? But uh, do, do you think we put unreal expectations on ourselves for Konama now? Like, do you see that within I newer players? That. I see that in some players. Like, um, for instance, there's a couple, I mean, just in my local community. Like, I remember, like, over the over the years or two, like, people would come and they'd be like, I just started playing. And then they would like, I want to do this trick. And I'm like, dude, you just started two weeks ago. That's a trick. Like, <laughs> that's a trick. Like, I don't know, like 1.5 juggle spike. And then like, they just started two weeks ago. I'm like, dang, like that's, that's a great goal to have, but don't, don't be mad if you can't do it for a bit. You know? <laughs> like, you know, like They'd be like, I can't do it yet. I'm like, yeah, cause you're only two weeks in and that takes a lot of technical skill. And that takes a lot of background work on different tricks too. Like, um, mm-hmm. Just for an example, like, um, but I see a lot of people getting hard on themselves. Like, in uh, 28 Tricks Later, too, it just happened. Uh, challenge, mm-hmm. the challenge, and that challenge is awesome. It also sucks at the same time. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Um, and I see, you see a lot of people, it's, I think it's a common thing to do in that challenge for when you see a lot of people saying, like, oh, it wasn't the hardest trick today, or, you know, like, oh, I've got this yeah. thing to pop out. But you know, you co- see that a lot. What is that? <laughs> I don't know. I think people need to. I mean, okay, obviously it's good. It's great to have to want to challenge yourself every day, but you're trying to put your, during that challenge specifically, you're posting a trick every day, you know, life happens. Everybody has different scenarios and life situations. You know, you just have bad days, off days. Yeah. Bad days too. Off days. Like some people may just not be able, not can't land. They can't, aren't as feeling good on a certain trick of that day. You know, people like say like, Oh, easy cop out. But you know, it's it's not that serious you know you're you, at the end of the day the trick the challenge is supposed to trick every day and like try as hard as you can to get you know a challenging trick yourself or, or you know so if, if the day doesn't you know uh allow that you know get something get something however you can you know um so yeah i see a lot of uh, unnecessary like really hard pressure on people like self mm-hmm. like personal pressure on themselves that i don't think is necessary i think it actually inhibits their uh, I mean, I guess mental progression in the game. Yeah, I, I think what, what the harm that it can do that I see is that it, it takes away the spirit of play and it puts yeah. you into like a different type of spirit of, of Kendama oh. that isn't really even Kendama. Like, okay, maybe a little bit. It's It's got that progression element to it, but a really unhealthy progression. It's like, I just need to hit something new that is going to make other people proud of me. Even though you're not even proud, like maybe you're proud of yourself, I don't know, but... But it's like you're putting an unreal expectation on yourself when the goal of Kendama is actually just for progression. It can be doing another yeah. trick that you've done before, even cleaner. It, yeah. can, it can be whatever. It could be a step backwards, too. Sometimes stepping backwards is the best thing you can do to, to step forward in, in the future. It's like, man, I, I think some people put way too much pressure on themselves and they burn out and they miss out on the community aspect of this game. It's yes. Like, the reason that some of the best players are the best players in the world isn't because they were the best at tricks, but they knew the people and they connected with other people. They showed up to events, they gathered, they, they spent time playing Nintendo switch together, whatever it was. It's just like, you just grow with other people. Yeah. That's what, that's, that's the heartbeat, at least in my opinion, but no, totally. And uh, going off what you said, like the best player is only the best right now, because I mean, the way the way you improve and get that good is by just sticking with it, you know? Not everybody's born with <laughs> genetic gifts for Kendama, right? Nobody nobody's gifted with like, oh I can pick it up, I can already triple light out slip. Like nobody nobody's like that. Everybody who's yeah. amazing at Kendama has put the time in, put the hours in. Um and, you know, just sticking with it is a is the best thing to do with Kendama, no matter how you feel in the moment. Is just look look further and be like, okay, like just as long as I, you know, stick with this game and keep mm-hmm. with the mindset that there's always like unlimited progression. Like that's, that's great. And that's why yeah. I, that's how people get so good in the first place and they always progress. 
Exactly. Okay, uh, let's hit two more Patreon questions and a couple from the chat, and then we'll, we'll jump into a little bit of today. I feel like this is going to be a long episode, and I'm stoked for it. <laughs> Uh, Jared Black uh, from from a local shredder here. People need to know this guy, man. Jared Black is one of the most consistent players who just grinds. He's so good and so underrated. Chrome just put out a post being like, what, you know, tag an underrated player. Oh, I just he's, saw that, yeah. He, he's my underrated player. So, guys, go follow Jared Black. He's I'll so check good. him out. Yeah, go check him out. He he plays like Wyatt Bray plays. You okay. Know, like very consistent, long lines. Has he got the down spikes too? Dude. He's good. Yeah, he, he doesn't, doesn't do the down whirls so much, but triple J's, triple lunar flips, triple everything, honed. Nobody knows him. Ooh, He's so that's... good. So good. Uh, but he wants to know, uh, what are your top three anime? Assuming you watch anime. I don't know if you do. <laughs> no, I do. I definitely do. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big anime fan, actually. Um, so my top three anime, I gotta say, okay, I'm not very cultured. I only watch shonen, so basically just action ones, like power, like anime, like power-ups and like skill, like mm -hmm. crazy, like uh, things in it. So I guess right now, top three, it's hard for me to name a top three, I guess, but um, Attack on Titan's up there. I'm not gonna name them in order because I'm just gonna say my three yeah. favorites. Attack on Titan, really, 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 really good. When I watch that, the first three seasons right uh, for the first time, season four is ongoing right now, but when I w first watched the three seasons of that, I was like, wow, this is, has to be my favorite anime so far. And that, that was huge for me because Naruto, I'm a huge Naruto fan. Um, so Attack on Titan, probably Naruto. Um, Naruto is just nostalgia factor for me. Mm -hmm. I watched it when I was growing up and I was like like nine. Um, so that was crazy. Like, all I'll ship it into. Uh, and then, so it's, it's talking to Naruto and um man I would have to look at my list every time I watch one I write it down so I don't remember what I watched I mean I, so I remember so I remember what I watched um uh I gotta say I'll just say Dragon Ball because that's another nostalgia factor sure. for me too I've read all of it um I've watched all of it Dragon Ball Dragon Ball Z Dragon Ball Super um so I'd say those three Naruto Dragon Ball Dragon and then um Tackle Titan Red on red. I have, I've only seen like a decent amount of Dragon Ball Z of those. I never got like super into anime. I tried going getting into it this year a bit. So I watched through a bunch of uh, Studio Ghibli and I watched yeah, nice. uh, I watched through Death Note and through Full Metal Alchemist uh, Brotherhood. Okay. And so I watched through a couple and I'll, I'll probably get into another one in the next little bit. So you got I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll watch Attack on Titan. We'll see. Do it. We'll give it a go, maybe. All right. Uh, we got a question here from the official Deep Purchase, Danny Purchase, longtime listener and supporter of the show. He wants to know, what's your practice routine like? Now, I do too, because, dude, like my, my first memory of you seeing you was you and your brother in the sweet squad at the, I was saying this at the beginning of the episode, in the mall, like, you know where the pool, or not the mall, uh, the hotel that we were at in MKO 2018. There was that big, like, foyer it. area where everyone yep. was jamming. And there was the pool and it's like you and your brother and a couple other people just like hitting the pro open tricks of the final eight or whatever, like they were big cups. Like it was just stupid to me. I was like, how does anyone do that? And then I'm just like sitting there trying to hit my amateur tricks like once in 20 <laughs> tries. And I was like, that's what it means to be a pro player. Um, yeah. What's your practice routine like for comps? Cause obviously you show up and compete very, very well. Okay. So for my practice routine for comps, it's not, it's not super crazy. It's not like super structured, super like super technical. It's pretty much just me running through the tricks. <laughs> it's pretty much just me running through the tricks. I mean, once a day, twice a day. Um, I guess if I'm really intense on a competition, I'll do them like three times a day. Although that is a lot. Like if I'll mm -hmm. run through the entire list three times in one day, that's, you, that's a lot. Do you have like a goal that you try to hit with each trick, like three times in a row or something like that? Do you do you have a system that you go through? um or do you just play no. i just play so like i just yeah it's really not too intensive for me i mean on the other hand it's not like I've, i'm out here winning a ton of comps right let me just say that right now no like i'm out here winning every comp. hey i don't um, know you just won sko so i mean yeah maybe it's a kickstart but um but yeah so i just basically make sure i'm i get on the tricks as, as early as i can um so that, that way i can identify which ones i need particular work in um and when that narrows down i'll probably like when I go through the list, when getting closer and closer to the competition, I mean, yeah, I'll still go through the entire thing, but if a trick is like that I notice for myself needs to be dialed in extra, yeah, I'll spend a couple extra repetitions on that one. Um, mm -hmm. So nothing crazy, just, just identifying which tricks I need to spend more time on and identify and maybe like figuring out, uh, trying little tips, like little mm -hmm. different ways of doing a trick too, to make it as easy as possible for me to, to reduce, to like reduce the risk of error to so low that, you know, I don't want the string getting in my way, right? Or I don't want like right. some 
off with like one to 100 thing happening too. I just want to mitigate all those chances of error to right. the lowest they can be on every trick. And then, yeah, doing that, going through the tricks and then identifying which ones I need more work in is pretty much my practice routine. That's super interesting. I don't think a lot of people think about it in that way that they're trying to find the little areas of the trick that they can mitigate to reduce the frequency of error. That's a different way of approaching a trick. It's like some people would approach it like, oh, I'm trying to look for all the ways to improve my success chance, you know, but you're mm -hmm. looking for the areas to improve that reduce your failure chance. Like you have the opposite mindset to it. I think that's yeah. really unique. That's cool. That's super cool. Um, uh, just want to remind those of you in the chat, if you want your questions asked, uh, we will try and get to yours. Uh, in priority, we go through the Patreon questions and the questions on the post, and then uh, we try to hit the ones in the live chat, but you got to put them in the question box at the bottom. That's that little Q&A tool. Otherwise, we just miss them in the chat because the chat goes by too quick. <laughs> And I don't want to spend time just scrolling up on that. So <laughs> make sure you drop them in the Q&A tool and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. Okay, let's run through a couple quick ones here and then we'll jump back into a bit of a combo and then we'll, we'll come back to some Q&A at the end. Sound good? Yeah. Beauty, okay. Alex underscore Tran underscore 23 uh, wants to know, is there a perfect trick you're trying to achieve through Kendama? <laughs> um, no, short answer is no. I mean, I definitely have tricks in my mind that are like, dream tricks for me but there isn't like a perfect trick that i that i would want to hit i'd say my favorite tricks though i guess if there was a perfect trick it'd probably be like some crazy triple consistency line with triple mm. flips because triple flips and around tricks are my favorite tricks um so something like with crazy consistency in there or like yeah just triples that would be my perfect trick but i can't name a combination off the top of my head for that some long tunbridge wells triples variation <laughs> <laughs> around tunbridge right wells, triple still flip yeah yeah no. <laughs> uh micah segura wants to know what is your quirk apparently okay i saw that i think that's a my hero reference that's a, that's another anime my hero okay. academia uh the quirks are pretty much their powers they're born with each person is born with um i don't have a quirk <laughs> don't have any special powers. It's, uh, it's your, your genuine charm. That, that's what it is. <laughs> All right, we'll go with that. Uh, Johnny Crest wants to know, he already asked this. We already, we already, talked <laughs> he already about answered this. it. Already <laughs> answered, Johnny Crest. What's it like being the goat's brother? Johnny. Dude, what's, the, what, what's Nick think it's like to be Zach's brother? That's the real question. I don't we'll, know, have to, we'll have to get into that sometime. <laughs> yeah. Dude, a guy looking this good, ready to teach no. piano lessons. That's what we need to do. Piano know. lessons. <laughs> A uh, long time listener, Dpats underscore 48. Dylan wants to know, do you think that you and Nick tried crazier tricks when playing games against each other? Because he says that game of Ken on the Swedes YouTube channel was just mind blowing. It was, it was crazy. You guys are nuts. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Um, I think that Nick and I, when we play Ken, it's, um, we just go for, yeah, whatever. Um, we try, we don't, when we play each other, we're, we definitely know going into the game, we're not just going to play and like land tricks that are, I guess, easy for us. We're going to try and challenge mm -hmm. ourselves to the, to the most. And that's why we hardly play Ken. Cause if we do play Ken, it's going to be over an hour long, probably. Um, <laughs> cause we're just there missing 95% mm -hmm. of the time. Um, but yeah, I think when we go, when we go against each other and Ken, we do tend to try, uh, I guess harder tricks than normal. I mean, when I'm going I always try, I always try and challenge myself when I play Ken against anybody. Um, but I guess when I know against when I go against Nick, our styles are so similar that like I know that if I keep going on a, like a, if I keep trying to challenge myself extra hard, like it's just going to be that much better to land mm -hmm. it. I'm going to feel that much better at landing it. And I know when going against Nick, um, then it's going to be fun for him to see too. And like he's going to challenge himself by doing that trick too. So yeah, I'd say I'd say going against Nick, I challenge myself a, a little more than uh, than normal. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you, do you beat him fairly often? Um, you could just well, say yes right now and we just just say it <laughs> i mean well we as i said we hardly play ken like oh, nick, yeah. and I, nick and i literally tried to play ken like i was like yeah you want to play ken like kind of was a joke in here like the other day and he's like yeah we played for like 10 minutes we're like we're not going to do this because we just don't want to i mean the last time nick and i played ken before hawaii was like six months ago so Crazy. <laughs> so yeah Crazy. that game was literally over an hour um i lost that one but um um, I don't know. I can't really, because we play Ken so infrequently, I can't say if I usually win sure. or not, but just in my mind, I remember, I remember going on a streak that where I just beat him like a lot in a row. So in my mind, I guess I say, yeah, yeah, but that's probably not the case. I mean, that was just a one instance, one time period in my mind, but yeah. I yeah. Give it, yeah. Do, do you like playing games of Ken? Like when you show up to jams, how many people come up to you and are like, yo, can we play a game of Ken? Um, um, I mean, not at the Seattle jams. Uh, no, nobody really plays Ken except for, I mean, maybe there'll be like, I'll play Ken in a Seattle jam every like once every like maybe five jams. 
I think. Uh, mm-hmm. It's really infrequent. But um, when I go to events and stuff, I mean, yeah, there'll be people who want to play Ken. And, and I'm down to, but I'll admittedly say it's not my favorite thing in the world. Because here's what happens sometimes when, when I play Ken with people. Um, as I said earlier, I want to play Ken. And I, when I play Ken, I just want to make a point to challenge myself. Because I don't think doing tricks that aren't challenging for me in Ken that I know will get the other person a letter just isn't fun for me. I think that's, mm-hmm. I just don't like playing that way at all. So t- I tend to want to like, I tend to want to challenge myself, which makes the Ken games long. But I, when I, when a lot of people play Ken with me, they'll uh, either land tricks that are just like super, like just you know you can tell they're not challenging themselves. It's like mm-hmm. super easy for them. And when I see that, I'm like, okay, like I I kind of see how you want to play this. Like then I'll start doing that too, just to like get it over with because I don't want to uh, play a game like that where I'm challenging myself and the other person's not. So it's not my favorite thing in the in the world, but to but I always love it when a player comes up to me and like you can tell like they're really trying and like that I'm like getting more stoked to try it too. So mm-hmm. we're, that game that game will be long. But um, but yeah. So I'll play Ken. I usually say yes like seventy five percent of the time when someone asks to play Ken on the other jam. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. So guys, if you see if you see Zach, ask him to play something different than Ken. He doesn't like it. <laughs> you heard it here. Or ask him anyway. So probably still say yes because he's a genuine guy. Say, yeah. You know. <laughs> When you, when you wear a collared shirt, you just got to pull Oh, my people. God. I should have worn this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we got a question here from Ryan uh, Talekter. Uh, again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Why hasn't Nick filmed a trick with the Zach mod? We need, we need to confront him on this. I don't even know, okay? He just doesn't, he doesn't like me. That's wow. the only answer I can say. No, um, I don't know. He just doesn't. Uh, gonna, he, gonna... He's only asked for a one. So ever since I had my pro mod. So in the past three and a half years, he's asked for one. <laughs> Terrible. I don't know. What, what don't a know. brother. Nick I know, game, right? guys. No more buying Nick mods. No, no more Nick, Nick mods, mods, guys. Zach mods only. But um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he'll maybe he'll fill the trick with the with my pro mod sooner or later. Um, who knows? <laughs> are, are you guys gonna make new pro mods soon? I uh, I mean, hey, uh, pro mods. Last time Nick and I got our pro mods was three and a half years ago. I think we're due for another one. So could Come, be in the coming around the bend here soon. You know, we'll see. We'll see. Who knows? Okay, Who knows? Uh, let me hit one more question here from the chat. Well, and then after this, we've done all the ones on the post. We'll take a break, go through some of the the more modern story, yeah. and then we'll we got a bunch of questions that are in the Q and A tool. Those of you guys in the chat, keep dropping them in there. We will try and get to those at the end. We'll try and hit through as many as we possibly can. So, last one here from the post: uh, Kendama Jin Triki thirty four. Don't know if that's right at all. <laughs> Wants to know when did tricks start being easy for you? Also, what is your top five Kendamas to play with? I. Uh, I'm going to come out and say, like, does Kendama ever get easy for anyone? I was about to say that. Yeah. So, tr- yeah, I don't think tricks, I mean, obviously, as I progress, tr- certain tricks become easier for me because I get more adept at them. But, like, I, yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't just say a blanket statement and say, I would never say, like, yeah, Kendama tricks are easy for me. Like, no, <laughs> I don't think that'll ever be, like, I'll ever be able to say that because there's always something to get better at. Um, so, I mean, short answer is Kanama tricks, I guess, are never, like, easy for me, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, I could get a time period, like, I couldn't even name a time period where I'm like, oh, yeah, at this point, like, I, I was good, you know? Like, I don't know. Uh, I can't really answer that question. I, short answer is, like, yeah, Kanama tricks are, are never, like, t- completely easy mm-hmm. for me. Um, top R- five Kanamas. I yeah, run us through the list quick. Okay, yeah. I'd say my pro mod. Um, I don't even know if I can get a top five, but that my pro mod, um, I don't know if people remember the V7 Prince that we put out like three years ago, V7. It was a prime custom. We've had a lot of prime customs. Yeah, um, quite I, a lot. Yeah, so many. Uh, uh, the 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 ice cream dama with the mint the mint one. That one's that one. I feel like most people know that one. Mm-hmm. It's the mint the mint yeah, chip nice. one. I used that Tama for World Cup 2019. Um, and those are the <laughs> those are my top three. I can't even name top five. There's no others. Those are just the only ones he plays. Do you play other shapes besides the boost? Maybe you're not allowed to say you do, but uh, I, who knows? But do, do, if, you, if you weren't to play the boost shape anymore, uh, what other shape would you want to be playing? Um, well, I, I would be allowed to say, what, yeah, if I did or not. I just don't. I just don't. I have so many. I'm very fortunate in the fact that I have access to so many Kanamas, kind mm-hmm. of just, I guess, whenever I want. So, um, I have so I have so many boosts that I just don't end up playing with any other Kanama. Sure. Um, um, but if I were to play another shape, I guess, uh, I mean, every Konama shape is good now. Like, um, I honestly think every Konama company has a, a shape that I would enjoy playing. Um, but right now, I'd probably say, like, I think Sulab, I, I like their shape. 
I know they came out with a new one. I haven't tried it yet. But Sulab, uh, Soul is a good shape. I think I like the Soul shape better than the one up. I know it's unpopular, but I like the old one. That. Yo, I pulled, yeah. uh, so I have a Kevin DeSoto mod. I pulled that thing out of the box. The first trick I did was like inward lunar, triple tap back, the flip back to inward lunar. And I hit that They're first so T in a game of Ken and I was like, what the crap? Yes. Yeah. It, it was so honed. It was like one of the most honed Ganamas I've ever played in my life. I yeah. need to find it because I should go pick that up. And I think I chipped it finally, but it was so uh, good. So uh, shape is fire. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, I want to know more modern uh, today. You know, we, we kind of caught up to your story of when you got sponsored and, and I kind of want to catch up to you today. Um, but outside of Kendama, what, what does your journey look like since your sponsorship? You know, you were in school, high school, you've graduated, you're in university now. Talk to me yep. a bit about your life outside of Kendama. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm, in I'm at UW, University of Washington. I was a, this is my third year. Um, so I started in 2018, my freshman year. Um, um, I'm studying communications and I'm minoring in, I got my minor in nutrition. I'm trying to minor in informatics too. Um, but what actually, is informatics? Informatics. I can't really give a good definition of what that is because it's so, it's so like the definition of it. I don't think there's a concrete definition, but I'd just say like it focuses on technology. It's just, it's a STEM minor, um, but like it focuses on tech and like it's how it interacts mm -hmm. with like human you know human interaction uh and tech so just the intertwinement of those two mm -hmm. um so but right now actually i'm going through a point in my life where uh where my academic career where i noticed that my credit situation since i did a little bit of this thing and running start in high school whatever i got some college credits in high school uh, that i was in a situation where i only need so many classes to graduate only like five and i didn't really want to do that with online school right now so actually ever since september i actually just been taking a gap year um, so I've just been working. Mm. So I was working at this boba tea shop. Um, really Yo, close that's to me. hype. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. Um, uh, I was working at that place for like eight months, um, ever since June. And then I actually just quit that place like a week ago, oh, a less than a week ago, actually. Um, and then I started working at this restaurant um, called Joey's. You might know it. You know Joey? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. if it's, is it, is it like the same chain yep. that we would have here in Canada? Yep. Dude, okay, so quick quick little aside story. I have, I have older sisters. They're like six and eight years older than me. They were turds to me when I was a kid. And <laughs> they took me they took me out with their like friend. They were like babysitting me when I was like, I think I was in like grade five or six or something. And we went to this place in Calgary in Princess Island Park. And there's a Joey's there. And they have like ginger beef uh, there. I think they had ginger That's beef so at the good. time or whatever it was and pizza. <laughs> and my sisters like didn't want me to eat the ginger beef because they wanted it. And so they told me, that it was cow brain. And then for years what? after that, I was like, I guess I just wow. don't like ginger beef because I'm not eating a cow's brain. And so for forever, wow. I thought ginger beef was just gross. And, and I was so disappointed and frustrated. And so I've always had a negative experience in my mind with Joey's, but oh I haven't been God. since. I'm sorry. I'm sorry they did that to you. I'm sure it I know. Amazing, what about the jerks? I know. <laughs> I love my sisters. It's um, funny in hindsight. Yeah, that's, that is funny. Um, but yeah, so most recently I've... Um, taking up a spot there. I'm trying to learn expo. I've never worked in a restaurant before, but uh, I'm trying to learn expo. I just had an eight hour shift yesterday as my second shift there. So trying to learn as fast as possible. I think I'll get a uh, really deep, really good hours there. So hopefully I get acclimated quickly, but so outside of working like full time. Um, yeah, it's just uh, playing Kendama. And then uh, I may am doing this internship for this nonprofit. I'm doing some work for a nonprofit uh, ever since January. It's called plus one foundation. Cool. And right now I'm trying, I'm like, I'm like the intern chair for this fundraiser we're putting together for June that revolves around physical activity. So that's, cool. that's uh, what I've been putting my time in recently. So yeah, what do you want to do after you graduate? You're getting your degree in communications. Uh, you're doing some work with a nonprofit right now. Is that the type of work you want to be doing? Um, you know, I can't, I've um, I'm only two months into this internship, but I to, if I were to answer that question now concretely, I'd say no. Um, mm. I can't really give a concrete answer to what I want to do after either. Cause I just, I mean, at the end of the day, I just want to do something that, like, helps people. Like, I know is benefiting someone in some way, like, either individually or, organi or mm -hmm. organizationally. Um, so it doesn't really have to be a job title related to, like, super intense, like, community service-esque things like Peace Corps. Like, I'm not – I don't think I'm looking for something like that in particularly. But if I were on, like, a team at, like, a company that was – that I could see, like, the – I guess the – award, like, the my results being, like, translated into, mm -hmm. you know – yeah you know what i'm saying my work being translated into results yeah um if i could see that happening for me like i know like my work is like meaningful then i'm all for that 
Um, just something that revolves around those things because I can't really give a job title or a kind of, yeah, job title or company that I want to be working for right now because I just want to get more experience. Uh, that's another reason why I didn't want to graduate uh, this past year because I just didn't think I was ready. And I don't want to go job hunting right now because it's probably even harder than it is regularly because it's all, everything's online and stuff. So, yeah. mm -hmm. That's cool. So will you, you're going to go back to school then in the fall. <laughs> is that the hope? Yeah, I'm planning on it. I also want to um study hopefully study abroad before i end college and i know that's 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 a kind of an insane goal to have with covid right now yeah um i did a um but i just really want to because i've heard so many great things about it and my brother said you gotta go to and, europe right that's where the, right, all the yeah. players are yeah and yeah, so was, the, the schools there are like old architecture that's just like dope and man i i would love to go to europe and, and do some schooling that'd be so fun no yeah that's my goal actually so hopefully within the next year 2021 2022 i make that happen that's super cool. That's so cool. So, okay, wait, but here's the real question. If you had the opportunity, like today, you, you had to give up your entire potential career, but pursue Kenoma full-time, but you knew that it would pay for life and you'd be able to do it full-time as a career, would you do it? Would you do Kenoma full-time if you knew it could cover your cost of living over, over your communications degree? Uh, uh, that's... My, oh man, that's a lot to think about. Uh, I'd have to think about that a lot more, but my, my instinctual answer is, um, is no. I'd say no for now because, I mean, I love Kendama, and I, I really do love Kendama, but if I were to base my entire life around it and go into the business side of it, I feel like loving it as my favorite pastime would kind of turn into, I, I would mesh the pastime and work, you know, those mindsets together. Mm -hmm. And I think that could potentially make it less fun for me um mm -hmm. i know max norcross so max norcross used to work for sweets for a couple of years mm -hmm. back in the day and he and he <laughs> he kind of jokingly he would always jokingly say this to me he'd be like yeah i never get into the business side of kendama dude i'm like <laughs> what um but he just went as a joke because i mean he that's what happened to him like he would mesh like the the work intensity with the you know the the pastime uh, mentality and those would intertwine and i don't think uh, he liked that as far as as far as i could tell what he told me um um, and I think I would feel the same way. I never, if I were to base my, I mean, Kanama is a huge part of my identity, but mm -hmm. it's not all who I am. And I think uh, there's a growth for me to be had if I were to take on different opportunities in professional mm -hmm. life or in different career choices. So yeah, yeah. I, I, short answer right now, just really, uh, probably just no, I wouldn't do that. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I am curious about that though. Uh, now, what, what, you're 21, 22? I'm 21 in April. 21 yeah. in April. Yep. So, you know, you're, you're, you're progressing into like deeper adolescence, you know, you're, you're hitting that drinking age in the States, yada, yada. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, have you found yourself wanting to distance more from Kendama in social environments? I can call it like university. Do you, do you want to be identified with Kendama still? Do you want your, your career path communications to be more of an identifier for you? Have you wrestled through that much yet? Uh, no, I, I definitely, I always, be chill to be like, I'll always be okay being identified with Kenama. Cause that's like having that around say. your neck at, at the office. Like I'll, yeah, I'll bring it to the, I don't know if, I, I don't know if I'll, I just don't really just tend to wear my Kenamas on my neck anyway. Sure. I'd rather just like, I actually haven't done that in a while. Um, but kind of just, I just like, I always have it on me, you know, in the strap right here, or you always have it on me on my purse, mm -hmm. like in my backpack or something. I'll always have that. So I'll always have it with me. But, um, but yeah, so I don't think I'll always identify with this. I don't think there'll be, I've never felt in the past where I'm like, oh, I think something else should kind of take over my main identity. Um, no, I'm totally, this is, this is what like, I guess this is my most main thing that like makes me unique, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to identify myself just because it does that. But I mean, it's just, I love it so much. I'm not ashamed of it at all in any way, shape or form. So, mm -hmm. um, and I love Kanama. So no, I definitely am always identifying with this. I always carry it around. I always like try and spread it to people. So yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. And I, I think honestly, like, wow, I like look back and see a lot of people that have made careers or at least like made decisions towards the career that they're going into based on a lot of the community development and learning that they got from Kendama. Do you think Kendama influenced some of your choice to go into communications? Some of the skills um, that you would have picked up through it? Yes, I'd say yeah. I mean, I mean, beforehand, so before college, I was, yeah, uh, fortunate enough to go on these trips across the country, across the world. And, uh, I just really found out that I like, like interacting with all different types of people. Uh, I've met all different types of people from all different types, all different cultures. So uh, just thinking about that, I'd say, yeah, that probably had a, a, an impact on my choice of major. 
Um, so yeah, just those experiences, with people, mm-hmm. everybody I've met over the past couple of years, probably. Yeah. has definitely influenced me. That's cool. Okay. Uh, let, let's talk a bit Kanama, uh, here modern. I want to talk about the documentary and, and I kind of want to talk a bit about, you know, what was the most defining moment in your Kanama career or like the, the moment that was like the most real, the most like, I don't know, state of flow you've ever been in for Kanama where you've just been like, wow, this was like when it truly clicked. What do you know what that moment was where it was just like everything changed? Man, uh, wow. I think that's tough. I mean, I, it's hard to me to identify one moment, but if I were to say a moment, it'd probably be two trips. So it'd be, and they're really close to each other. So 2017, it was right before I turned pro. So it was, I went to Romania like a month before MKO in 2017. Oh, I forgot you did that. That was insane. So I think everybody who played at that time or has heard in the past that Romania was crazy. It blew up like no other in that country. Phenomenal was huge there. So, I mean, I've literally felt like, okay, I know I'm, I have notoriety in the Konami community, but I, there were some points in that trip where I legit felt like a, like a real celebrity. And that was just like crazy to me. Um, Did you sign lots of Konamas? Yeah, that um, totally. I mean, like I remember during that event, I was, when you pull up the Sharpie at that type of event, you're signing yourself up for a 40 minute block in your day. Cause That's literally crazy. nonstop 40, like 40 minutes. I'm just doing this, doing this. Um, that was just surreal for me. And I mean, 800 kids came to that event. Wow. That main event, 800 kids, 200 that, had to wait outside for the that's entire more day. More than that. MKO. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's right. Like it's, it's crazy. Like the event, entire venue is packed. I mean, if you talk to Christian or my brother about this, they'll say the same thing. Like that's, that's when I really felt like a pro, like when I felt like a pro Kanama player, mm-hmm. like I got recognized in the streets too, rocking around our man. Like what the heck? Like this is crazy. So it was that, that was crazy for me. And um, then like a month after that, I turned pro, like I got a pro model and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was announced at MKO. That was insane for me too. Cause I mean, I yeah. never thought that I would make it that far in Kanama when I started. So just those two moments, the Romanian trip and then going into being like a legitimate label pro uh, in Kanama was, those were uh, insane for me. Yeah. And there were some big moments along that journey too, right? Coming, coming right after that, you know, you had your pro mod it and pro mod edit that blew up. People just yeah. went nuts on that. And as well, then you had the big documentary, which I thought was one of the coolest pieces of content that was put out during that era of Kanama. What was that like? Was that weird to, to get, you know, documented uh, for Kanama? You were what? Um, were, you even, were you even 18 at the time? Yeah, I just turned 18, actually. I think we started filming that right after my 18th birthday. Um, it was crazy. I never thought, like, I think we were just, I didn't think it would turn into a whole documentary, actually. I think we were just doing a little segment. So here's how the story went, actually. So we were just filming in my, ho- in our, in my hometown, so call me. Um, yeah, me and Nick. Cooper came out, uh, filmed some stuff. Um, just in so call me. We filmed some tricks, did all that, blah, blah, blah. And then I think we met up another time in Seattle. Mm-hmm. I think that was it. And then I think I thought that was just going to be the video. I didn't know it was going to be like a doc. I mean, I knew it was going to be a documentary, but the the length of it was, I didn't think it was going to be 40 minutes. I thought it was going to be like 15 minutes max, mm-hmm. 10 minutes maybe. But then we just didn't, we didn't film for a while. But, uh, the, but then uh, Nick and I got this opportunity to go on so many trips in the next couple months. I'd say, yeah, senior year of high school, 2018, that was an amazing year. Could have come for me. I was blessed with a lot of trips during that year. Um, so, but, Cooper ended up going on these trips too. And so I think just this progression of us going to all these different places together, just coincidentally, that made it, that made it so we could create enough content for that documentary. So it was Stone Quality, Seattle. I think we might've filmed a little bit at Tacoma, maybe. Um, then I went to Detroit, like Michigan and then Japan. So like four or five different places that we went to that create that over the span of six months. And like, no, I never thought that was, the, the idea of a documentary about myself like that and my brother like that was so crazy to me because mm-hmm. yeah, i don't think that ever that documentaries were very few and far between during that time yeah that thought, content really didn't exist in Kanama at the time yeah and so just seeing that formulated in the process and then seeing the trailers of it finally come together when cooper was like really done putting all that footage um aside and editing it together when i saw that his previews before he put it out i was like wow like this is real like this is crazy like this story he's telling it was like a huge story about like uh me and my brother's upcoming we had the baby videos at yeah. the beginning we the had blonde like, hair the mohawk blonde hair like cooper did such a good job like grabbing content from over the years that um nick and i created back in the day um yeah. 
So just having that, that was a crazy experience. That was crazy to see. I believe it. I believe it. One of the questions that I think I, I kind of want to know the answer of that, that probably is may, maybe you haven't thought about maybe, maybe you have, but the pivot of you looking up to pros to other people looking up to you, the transition period of you becoming the peop the person that people are coming up to saying like, Zach, sign my Kandama. <laughs> Zach, you're so good. Zach, oh, follow me back on Instagram, please. <laughs> Does Zach play a game of Ken with me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what, like, how do you, how did you handle that, that transition? Um, man, that's, that's another, that's another great question. You know, that transition, I never had a conscious moment where I was like, Oh, I'm pro now. Like I'm that person where, you mm -hmm. know, I sign Kadamas. I'm, I'm quote unquote famous in the you know, I'm community. I never yeah. had a conscious moment where I had, it just like, I just kind of like slowly realized that I was out after I was sponsored and I was going to more events. I was like, Oh, like this is happening more and more and more. Um, for me, like when I think about that, it's just, I just keep going back to this moment where like, you know, when I picked up Kendama when I was 11, never thought in my life any of this would happen, you know, through Kendama. So whenever I think about that, I'm always, that's why I'm always, I'm always responding to people in my DMs or Facebook or whatever. I'm always doing that because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm just a normal person, right? Like I'm just a normal person uh, who's played Kendama for a, a very long time. And um, I like to stay humble because, about that stuff because, it's nothing crazy. I'm just, yeah, I've just been playing for a while, you know, um, that's just all it is. And so when I think about that, when people reach out to me and that, like, and kind of, I guess, put me as their, like their idol in their minds, um, that just, that kind of inspires me to be like, wow, like, I can't believe I'm at that place in some people's minds. I got to keep going, you know, got to keep playing Kendama. Like, mm -hmm. and that's kind of how I, uh, that kind of motivates me to, you know, structure Kendama into my day now too. Um, when I entered college, I had a brief period where, um, college is hectic. We all know that you learn a lot about yourself. You know, a lot of things are going on. Um, and I actually even found myself, I wasn't playing a lot of Kanama during my first three weeks or month ish in college because I just wasn't prioritizing it. Um, you're meeting hundreds of new people. Yeah. I was, you know, there's doing so much else going, going on. to different things, uh, all that. And I was like, I would come home at like three days. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to touch a Kanama in three days. I'm like, huh, whatever. But then I, when I went to MKO that year, I was like, okay, snap out of it, Zach. Like you, you're at a place in, right now where like I kind of put it I was like okay I want to I have a responsibility I'm sponsored I'm a pro like after going to that event I got you know I had that inspiration to play Konami again so ever since then I I structured it into my day because if I didn't structure it into mm -hmm. my day at college I was never going to play so I set a time I blocked time my day out to play and um, that kind of just the, for, the motivation for me doing that is in part stems from you know that me being that like I guess that that pro now you know that pro yeah. that I I guess being being an idol for some people um that kind of is a motivator. Does that get to you ever on. that do you put that pressure on yourself? Does that come from your sponsorship or, oh, and is that a um, good pressure that you like, or does that sometimes exhaust you? Does it feel um, like a I don't job? think, no, no, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a job. I think sweets is, sweets is uh, really cool in the fact that they don't force us to, they don't like have a, a strict expectations, strict uh, things they force on us as sponsored players. Um, because I think sweets knows that, well, this is an important part of all of our lives. This is a part of our lives, not our whole life. Mm -hmm. So they do a really good job in that, not putting a ton of like unnecessary pressure for Kanama on us. Um, I never put a ton of pressure on myself because as long as I keep a routine of me, you know, playing and I guess posting, uh, everything's going to be fine. Like, um, even if I didn't play, play or post for a while, that's okay too. You know, life happens. Everybody, um, that's mm -hmm. fine too. But I've never, I don't think I've ever had a point in my life where I put a ton of pressure on myself to be like a good pro or, a, you know, a, a good, like a good like promoter for sweets. I just kind of think that, um, just comes to me. Um, yeah. I think it just happens. I, I think it's good that I don't have to put a lot of pressure on myself too. Cause I think that's putting a lot of pressure for that type of stuff is, um, for, in my case, I think, uh, unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. That's yeah. I think it's really cool. Your journey in particular is so, so unique. I think, well, I mean, everybody's journey is so unique. We're all unique individuals. Yeah. But just watching your development of being that kid, you know, in those stores with the blonde hair, progressing to where you are today, you know, you've matured in, in so many ways to who you are, you know, your involvement in the community, et cetera. It's just really cool. Uh, and I kind of, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up here pretty quick and we'll do some, some questions from the chat, but I do want to know what does the next like two years look like for you in the Kanama community? What do you, who, who are you becoming? Do you see yourself still trying to compete at the highest of levels? Do you want to phase out of that? You know, what are some of those answers to those questions? 
Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Two years. I think about it. I know it feels like a long time, but I know it's going to come here quicker than I know it. Um, next two years, I definitely want to be playing Kendama, at, like being competitive with Kendama for as long as possible. So mm-hmm. I don't, I don't really have a time period where I know where I can say right now, like, Oh yeah, by this time I'll just take a drop off. No, like I'm going to try and keep going for as long as possible. And you know, as, if I gain more responsibilities and my life changes so that I can't compete at that level anymore, then, you know, so be it. Life happens, but um, I'm going to prioritize Kino in my life. Uh, uh, in the near, I can definitely say for the next two years, I'll be prioritizing Kino. So that is a, that is a standstill in my life, right? For now, I can definitely say. Um, uh, as far as my like player development, I mean, in the next two years, I assume I'll be if if I'm pro in the next two years, I'll probably be on my way out of pro. Honestly, I mean, again, it goes back to my involvement in Kino at that point. Like if I'm I guess if I'm dropping off or if Sweets picks up new players that, you know, new young guns that are ready to, like, tackle their next five, six years of Kanama play super mm-hmm. hard, then I can imagine. I could see myself going to the Legend team, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'd say that besides that, though, um, two years is, well, yeah, as I said, well, it seems so far away. I, it, it is pretty short time period, so I'll probably still be play, prioritizing Kanama. And if anything... If life you know, life happens and I can't prioritize and I can't compete at that high level anymore, mm-hmm. um, then I'll probably be like move to legend or and I, but I'll be content with that too. So yeah, do you see yourself becoming kind of like one of the the judges or hosting events or anything like that? Do you do you see that as something you'd want to be doing in the future as running events? Because from my recollection, I don't know if either you or your brother do a ton of event hosting, like coordinating that stuff too much, or maybe you do. Maybe I just don't know. Um, uh, for for the judging. I don't know. I think judging's, I mean, I could, judging's hard, okay? Judging's yeah. tough, dude. Like, you're the it person is. making those calls, and that's my, that's the worst nightmare of a judge. When it's actually close, and you, <laughs> you have to make the call, that sucks. Yeah, that I sucks. love it. I love judging. It's one of you my You love judging? Games. Okay, yeah. I hate judging. <laughs> but it's so, still, believe me, it's stressful as heck. It's so stressful. Um, but yeah, I don't see, I don't think I'd, I'd be fine judging, but I wouldn't prefer it. Um, um, and then for running events, I'd say, I mean, I've done a little like local, like I haven't done anything huge, like mm-hmm. where I like you get sponsors from my like, companies and like, mm-hmm. you know, promote on social media for like players across the nation to, you know, go come over. But I mean, like locally, like I've set up some stuff, um, but I mean, I'd be interested in doing that. Um, I definitely think hosting a come event would be a nice challenge and be super, super fun. Um so I'd be interested in doing that. I know you just held one recently, right? The, the yeah, battle. back in back in October, it was crazy. It was nuts. That was <laughs> yeah. What that a was wild. crazy to see in COVID times. Like, but that was awesome that I saw that. I was it, like, yes. it was like in that gap period where restrictions were lifted. We could have a group of up up to fifty people, and we're just like, this is our this is our shot. This is the this time. is this is the time to do it. And we had we we filled out our event. We had you know just under fifty people in the building. It was amazing. It was it was such a cool like two day three day period it was a one day event gosh man i like i want to be there so bad it looked right so cool it oh, looked amazing i was, was so a lot of we'll get you we'll get you out here uh next year you know hopefully yeah. covid is no more and, and we can we can scale it up to 100 plus 200 people uh, that will caffeinate everybody it's gonna be a good time <laughs> Absolutely. Cool, man. Um, let's, let's hit a couple questions here. We'll wrap it up. And then uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot more content here through the questions. There's like 20 in the chat already. So we, All right. we'll hit through some of them. Yep. I'll try and pick some quick ones, some other ones that we can dive a little deeper into and we'll, we'll go through it that way. Uh, I think this was already answered, but Dylan J. Johnson wanted to know, uh, what was your first Dama? If you want to just hit that one quick. Yeah. Light Blue Azora from Konami Say. Light Blue Azora, Konami Say, classic too, yeah. right? Uh, Tony Serrato, <laughs> why don't you, Zach, grow a sweet mustache like Adam? <laughs> could you could you tell Nick? Uh, can, can could you help? It, oh, it could help tell you and Nick apart. Um, I don't I don't know. I mean, I can you, totally. You don't actually, want this. I don't I don't know if I want a mustache. I can totally grow one. That's you one, definitely one, don't one, want one, one like this. <laughs> I don't know. I just I'm not feeling the mustache for myself right now, personally. <laughs> yeah, man, I hardly feel it on myself too. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> um, what? Okay, I don't know what this is, but uh, uh, from Kevin Tran, Om of GHL, Kevin and Nama, oh Uncle my. Fatigues. What, what is, is okay? Yeah, that's just <laughs> what. <laughs> like, um, okay, it's just this pizza place. Okay, in in Vancouver, that's super close to the Terra Shop. So two years in a oh. row, when we go to Van Jam, it's always like a point to go there. Like 
every other day. I think one day we went every single day to go there. Um, it's just a pizza place that like the, the people working there are like super like they're pretty funny and they like know us as canal players and like it's kind of just like a joke, I guess, because we literally went there every day for one year. <laughs> and then yeah, it's called Uncle Fatty's. That's awesome. Are, are you a big foodie? You worked in the candy shop. You worked at a boba shop, and now you're working <laughs> at a, a restaurant. Would you consider yourself a foodie, or do you just like the restaurant slash food industry? Um, I'm not. I, I wouldn't say I'm a foodie. Um, I definitely, I definitely like. Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm a foodie. Like, I can't really. I, I like good food, but it's not like I'm at that level where I can like particularly tell what distinguishes great food from like. Uh, mm. magn- like magnificent food you know like i wouldn't I'm not, I'm not on that level where i'm searching for new recipes and all that stuff i'm pretty uh eight pretty eight pretty basic but um i just short answer, yeah no i'm not a foodie <laughs> yeah um, so you're working at joey's right now uh what, what's your role there i don't know if you actually said maybe you did oh yeah it's a uh, expo so i'm like so the people on the on the line they're cooking it's food and they're putting together orders and they're um they're putting the food out front and i'm just it's my job to like get those uh plates in order of the seat numbers too and like print out match the tickets call call uh servers over to run those run those run that food those food items um too to their tables um it, it's a simple in concept but i'm still learning it's my first time and uh it gets stressful especially around dinner dinner rush because like there's a lot happening once there's a ton of food coming out uh, that you're it's, it's my responsibility to like you know get those organized and ready for the servers so yeah i'm still learning Mm, absolutely and this is a good follow-up question from adam i think uh be, coming from the food industry you know uh, this is a question for both of you uh what's your favorite food do you want to go first yeah yeah go ahead oh okay um yeah i'll go um you know okay yeah, i said pretty basic I, I really like meat i think um and like um but i guess right now i'd say salmon i'm having a lot of salmon recently so salmon's oh, yeah. great. and that salmon salmon's pretty big out in seattle right yeah, there, there's luckily a lot of it's it's really big out here. Yeah, I've I've been living in the prairies for pretty much my whole life. And I try not to eat too much fish because you know, what you don't know how long it's been on on route for you. I guess. Oh just yeah, fresh, yeah. You know, so I I avoid it. Uh, for me, my favorite food probably for breakfast is like crepes. I freaking love oh, crepes, but for God. dinner you can't beat a good steak like you Gordon can't. Ramsay style cast iron. You put some salt, pepper, let that thing sit at room temperature, slap that in the cast iron at nice hot heat, get a nice oh. sear, butter, rosemary, garlic. Mm, you just can't beat Dude, that. Dude, you sound like you know what, Dude, what's going on. You sound my, like you know how to cook a steak. I tried I, one time and it was, I'm not picky how I like my meat, and so I liked it, but it was not how I planned. Yeah. But I, yeah. I love, you know, if I'm going to cook a steak, you know, steak's so freaking expensive. I learned this. Super expensive. You know, whenever, I never took this, for, I took this way for granted growing up. Like my parents <laughs> would make steak or something for dinner for a family. And I was like, oh, it's just steak. It's like, it's good. This is nice. And then you like go to the store when you're an adult and you like shop and you're like, oh crap. Yeah. This is like a part of my paycheck. Yep. Like and it's so you're huge. Like, if you're, so then I'm like, if I'm going to buy steak, I better do it the right way. You know, right. if, you know, if I'm going to spend this much money, I should at least get an idea of what I'm doing. So I watched totally. all the Gordon Ramsay videos I could find. I got to okay. do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. Let's hit up a couple more. Is NZ Kendama going to come back? Uh, no. And he, I think he's referencing. And like, so that was the channel that Nick and I put all of our videos on for the first two or three oh. years of playing. Um, so, yeah, Nick and I always used to make Kendama at back in the day. Um, but no, I don't think so. We don't, we don't use that channel anymore. <laughs> mm. A little personal question again from C underscore B underscore three underscore O. Uh, do you and Nick have girlfriends? Uh, no. There you go, ladies. <laughs> uh, we got a question. This isn't a question, but just a little comment. Hey, what a stud from Steezy Steve. Guys, Steve. we got the professor in the house here looking good. Oh, stop calling me the professor. <laughs> uh, actually, here's a good follow-up question about the NZ Kendama channel. Uh, what's your favorite edit from there, from Ryan? Oh, that's a good question, Ryan. Um, you know, you can't be the lopez videos okay if you haven't seen the lopez videos i I encourage you to watch them nick and i made two of them one of them is called lopez lacing and actually i guess there's three so there's throwaway edit one he's called throwaway edit so that's that's on lopez island so lopez island is part of the san juan islands here in washington um so yeah there's throwaway at one you have to boat out to it or something yeah so we took a ferry we took a ferry out um so throwaways throwaway edits one and two are great throwaway edit two i particularly like 
um just the vibes like nick and i were like 13 and 14 in those videos so just great great stuff the tricks were great i mean <laughs> they're just so nostalgic for me those they're, they're just awesome to film and then we made another edit called lopez lacy and i think that was on the sweets channel so check out those I, okay that wasn't enzy canal video but check out all those videos so from the enzy canal video i'd say throw away at it too is the is that channel still up the nz nz Kendama channel? yeah so yeah and recently and recently i actually i had a lot of those videos unlisted for a lot of years um mm -hmm. for like multiple years because they were just some of those videos are so embarrassing that i was like okay i was like <laughs> 11 when i made these like but i recently i recently made them all public so you can go check out what nick and i were like when we were 11 making our first ever edits so go go dude i i check never do out. edits but i did an edit when i was like not even like a couple months into kendama yeah. it's so bad i didn't know what kendama etiquette was so i didn't know you were supposed to finish tricks on the spike yeah so i would do these like spacewalk uh, swirl lines whatever because you know super dave mateo inspired and just catch it on a big cup and i'd be like what up yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, <laughs> so funny that you say that because I have the same, the same thing in the edits. Like, literally the first three edits, Nick and I made three edits in, like, one month. <laughs> and, like, for the first two edits, I would, like, I would, like, I would bird like this. I would hold the cup like this, and I'd hold it like this, and I just, and I wouldn't spike it. I'd get it, and I'd, like, walk toward the camera, and, like, fade away, transition to the next trick. I'm, like, and I want to watch it, I'm, like, wow, Zach, like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I know, yeah. and... And then that, and then some jerk in the community comes along and says, you're supposed to spike it. And you're like, I know. Oh, it's like, oh man, it was so hard already. Yeah. Uh, we got a question here from Ryan again. Uh, Ryan's been quite active today. We love it. Uh, he wants to know, what's a trick you do every day? Your go-to trick. Like, what's the trick you can't not do in a day? Oh, juggle, anything juggle to a stall. Like juggle to bird. Anything mm. like that. Yeah. I, I wish I could do those better. I'm, I'm working on them. <laughs> they're working tough. On. Yeah, they're not easy. Uh, Kevin Tran, Hick Tran wants to know, how are you so cracked at Dama and keep your hair so nice? How much gel do you put in there? Um, not that much. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that much, but um, like a full container every day. The, no, <laughs> to answer the Dama question, I mean, <laughs> how much so cracked at Dama? I'm, I've just played a lot over the past nine years, I guess. I'm, <laughs> um, anyways, I just play, I just played. I've been in the hours of the past nine years. Um, how do I keep my hair so nice? Um, I don't know. You get some product, you know? You get some product. Uh, you got a hair you, product sponsor you want to shout out somebody? on the show? Uh, yeah. I mean, re this is <laughs> – I put Sumo Tech in my hair this morning. I think it's from a company called Bubble and Bubble. I got it – you get it at Sephora. Um, yeah, my mom put me onto that. She got me at one time. And I was like, oh, this is pretty good. Um, and then the other – I haven't – I used to – recently I've been using another one, but I forgot the brand name, so – Okay, yeah. fair. okay oh, here, here's a really fun question. I think that, that probably doesn't get talked about too much in the Kanama world. So obviously you have like a pr pretty significant following on Instagram. What, 30, mm -hmm. 30 some thousand followers? No, no, that's 20. It's 24. Okay, what, 24, whatever it is. You got a fair amount. That's like an influential size of followership. You know, a lot of brands out there are probably, you know, sending you DMs on the regular saying like, hey, we want to work with you. We want you, we want you to post about our problem, yada, yada, yada. Have you ever taken any other brand deals from other companies? What does that look like? Are there brands you'd want to work with outside of the Kanama world? Um, I've never taken a brand deal from any any thing, any company. I've like, I've gotten you know, it's like it's it's semi common to get to have emails in my inbox that are like, oh, we want to collab with you, not like a serious collaboration. I feel like they're kind of just like spammy esque things. I mean, I'm sure if I d acted on it, it would become it would elicit some sort of legitimate result, but like. I mean, there. Yeah, I'll get emails in my inbox that are like, "Oh, you want to collaborate with this person's following," but I'm just like, "No," because that doesn't really seem legit. Or like, I mean, recently, like a local clothing company actually just like hit me up. Uh, literally, like, that's uh, kind of affiliated with UW. Um, mm -hmm. um, so maybe I'll do something with them. But like, I've never acted on any uh, brand thing or anything from any DM or email I've gotten. No. Yeah. I'm always curious because it's like you got a good following. Obviously, you could use that and, and turn that into some sort of a, a monetary benefit where you can begin to supplement some income, you know, pay for some college classes by doing yeah. <laughs> some brand stuff here and there. But yeah, it, maybe maybe you can't talk about this too much. But I, I think people are always curious on the pro side of things. You have a pro mod. Uh, they're assumedly I, I'm pretty sure Sweets does royalties uh, yep. with their, their pro mods. How how significant is that for you in terms of, you know, helping pay for college or helping pay for whatever? Does that actually make up a fair amount? Okay, so... I don't, you can say as much or as little as you're allowed to or want to. Right, right. Um, so, you know, I've had a couple people, my pop in my DMs or 
mentioned me in comments in the past and be like, hey, so like, how much are you making for Kendama? You obviously have a good following. Like, you're I'm, you're probably making like between what, fifty and sixty k, like thirty and sixty k a year. People think, like, people think you make that much. I've gotten those comments before. People are like, yeah, you what are you making like that much? And I'm like, oh my. God. And they're like, come <laughs> like, on, you can I send was. me a free Kendama. Like, you're already making so much. Yeah. No. Um. I would. I will. I will say this. When you when you have a pro mod, you do get royalties, but. In the grand scheme of things, personally for my situation, um, when I'm at school, either paying tuition, like for tuition, I guess right now I'm like paying paying rent. I'm not paying tuition right now, but let's just add all these in: tuition, rent, you know, food, all that. Is royalties going to make that much of a difference in the in the grand scheme of covering all those expenses? No, not at all. It's very minuscule uh, in comparison to all those expenses. But I will say though, it is really nice when you get something in your PayPal and you're like, Oh my gosh, that money is from my royalties. And yeah. I'm technically, you didn't really have to do anything to get those. Like technically you just stood there and your skin almost old. And now that some of that money is yours, you know, like that feels good. It's, it's nice to have that, like that, take that money, put it in your pocket and be like, okay, like now I got a little extra money to spend. So that, it's always super nice. And I really appreciate sweets for doing royalties like that. Um, it's, it's been really nice over the years. That's fair. Uh, okay, I want to ask one more question. I'll check if there's some uh, some other good ones we want to ask here in the chat, and then we'll we'll put our bow on this. But if you had to put away Kendama for forever and pick up a different skill toy, uh, what skill toy would you want to pick up and play? Yeah, uh, dang, that is a that's a okay. I'm, I'm uh, I wouldn't say yo yo. Um, I suck at yo yo. I, I actually yeah. I actually tried to get into it, and I just can't. It's it. so different from Kendama. I feel it's like so yo-yo different. players can get into Kendama better than Kendama players can get into yo-yo. Yeah, I'd say that 100%. Like, I don't know. It's something about yo-yo, it's not as intuitive, right? You got to, like, actually look up stuff. Like, mm -hmm. um, I learned. But I'd say skill toy. Like, I don't know if a skill toy pops in my mind, but I'd say, like, juggling. You know Lucas Adverse? Um, yeah. He does a lot of really, really, really cool juggling. He's so good at juggling. Um, I'd probably do that. Dude, big shout out to one. Lucas, by the way, for hooking up Jacob Acrobat. With Adama, biggest biggest Kendama news in my world <laughs> for the past month is seeing a fellow Canadian uh, Cirque du Soleil actor, yada yada, pick up a Kendama, and he's been posting. And I think you guys sent him out a package like Sweets Kendamas did, yeah, which is yep. hype. He's like, that's pretty big for no, for, huge. for our world. I think that's cool. Yeah, I also want to say something about that guy. I'm calling BS on him just starting Kendama recently. No way this dude could Ken flip juggle Ken flip the big cup in the first couple weeks of playing. Dude, but the and guy, looks, I don't know, <laughs> man. Possible. I think he's the chosen one. Like he, he might be. He's like the one that's going to bring the ring to Mordor for us. He's going to be the one who unlocks everything. <sighs> that, that, I saw that. I'm like, he just said he, he just said he just got into this. Like, what? I know. <laughs> Absolutely bonkers. But the guy, like if you scroll through his stuff, the guy's like throwing knives up and catching them between his toes in a grape and stuff. And it's like, yeah. what, what is, what, who, A, who's that twisted and sociopathic to do that? And then B, it's like this guy needed a kendama years back. That that's, seriously, that's what it is, you know. It's, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Day four, he did it in more rural. It's like the guy just like intuitively understands hand-eye coordination better than probably any of us that play kendama yeah. will ever understand. Yeah, it's wild. He's gonna get so good so fast. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna start a campaign trying to get him on the the review soon. I don't even know Ooh. if he speaks English, but but he's definitely a. Uh, a hot pick for this year that I'd love to get on. That'd be crazy. I don't even think it's going to happen. It'll That'd be, be fully French. <laughs> <laughs> but bonjour. Yeah, I, I can try your best. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Je m'appelle Adam. Yeah, get someone else in here to do some translating. Yeah, we'll get Tio back on here to do some, yep. some translating. Okay, uh, last question that I'll, I'll ask. I, I think I said that already, but what is something that you would like to say to the Kenoma community? You know, what is, what is a piece of wisdom uh, that you think that the Kenoma world needs to hear today? Uh, I think I already said, yeah, I would say the same thing I kind of already said earlier. It's like, I kind of touched on like, you know, just instead of, I know social media is such a big thing and part of Konami now, but, and it's easy to compare yourself to other players that are, have way more experience than you and, and, and by, and also related to that are probably just a lot better that, at some tricks than you. Um, I just want to say that Konami at the end of the day, it's a really, really fun. And hopefully your motivation is to play Konami and feel to how fun it is. Um, I wouldn't get too caught up on comparing yourself to better players. I mean, I can speak from experience. I used to compare myself. I, I mean, I still kind of do unconsciously to Nick because we're brothers, but I mean, I used to have a, I used to be in a really negative place where I compared myself to Nick and I never thought anything I did was good because of his success and watching his success. Um, even though I was still progressing at a good pace, 
Um, so I can speak from personal experience that that's a bad place to be. And mentally, that's not a place you ever want to be in. Mm-hmm. So I'd say if you are in a mental place where you are comparing yourself to players um, who are, and you really want to just do a trick that's super hard just so it, it can match up to like, I guess the level of play that you deem as like adequate. Um, don't worry about that. Just focus on challenging yourself in their own ways. You know, if you, you should want to be comparing yourself to you. And I know people hear that all the time, but seriously, that's will help you in bounds uh, to, to, with the longevity of playing Kendama because a year ago, compare yourself to where you were a year ago. Or if you haven't been playing for a year, you know, when you started, how much better are you, are you now than, than then? Mm-hmm. You know, you're so much better. You, you probably have so much more experience in your belt. You've met so many more people. All of that is what, make Kenama, is what makes Kenama great. You know, progression, meeting people, like community. We're very blessed to have a, an amazing community. Just focus on those things, continuously challenging yourself um, in any, any which way possible. And, and you're going to be good. Um, so those are the words I'd like to say for that. Dude. Amen. Preach it. Dude, I, I, one thing that I think actually clicked for me when you were talking about that is that in our current culture with COVID, there's so much distance between actually connecting with people in the community. Sure, we like FaceTime and stuff like that. But when you actually show up to an event and meet people for the first time, and even when you compete against someone, when you're at MKO or NAKO or any of these events, hardly ever do you see people actually competing against other people. You actually see, you know, in these competitions, your opponent cheering you on to land the trick. It's, yeah. Sorry, it's a totally backward system that in almost every other sport in the world. And I think people need to get out to a community event and just picture that, experience that, and learn that it's not about trying to beat other people. It's about beating yourself, you know, getting better than yourself mm-hmm. daily. And you said that so perfectly there. So thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you for jumping <laughs> on here, Zach. Thank you for sharing some of your story, for diving into the, the emotional stuff, diving through the sponsorship, through your life. Uh, there's so much content in here for those of you that are joined in a little bit late, make sure you go back and rewatch this or listen to it on Spotify or your favorite podcasting software out there, wherever you listen to your podcasts, do people listen to podcasts? (laughs) Apple, Uh, Spotify, I don't know. Whatever they all are. Uh, thank you so much. Make sure to go cop a Zach mod where we're going to start the hashtag Nick gate, uh, until, until Nick plays a Zach mod (laughs) publicly. Yo, I'm going to type something in the chat real quick use i have a discount code that i haven't been promoting recently use my discount code at sweets it is zach 2020 put it in the chat boom it's posted okay use my discount code at sweets if you want to buy my pro mod or any other product from there use that you get 15 percent off 15%. there you go 15 percent. why pay full price when you're buying your next when Zach you can mod? get 15 percent when off. you get 15 percent okay. off 15 percent off you do that like 10 times that's enough to get another kendama for free Think exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you so much for jumping on here. Thanks for sharing your story. Uh, thank you for encouraging us all uh, to progress in Kanama. Uh, and that is not just about us. It's about the broader community. I think that's so important. And, and honestly, like just such a great conversation. I think uh, th- this will be a good one for people to listen to and get to know you. Uh, yeah, well. I, hope, I hope people enjoy this one. I want to say thank you to Adam. Thank you so much. Dude, doing these interviews seriously they're so they're so awesome that you do this people the Konami community needed an extra one like this off dominators there's so many interview series have gone like just kind of trailed off into like nothing in the past people stop but you you keep going you make it a point to do it every week uh i'm going to speak for everybody and say that we really appreciate these these interviews because we get more in depth more into the minds of people we want to you know who are in the community doing awesome things so thank you so much adam you, you rock for doing these Oh, man. I appreciate you for saying that. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I love doing it every week. And we are back next week with actually another Sweets team member. We got uh, Carly Carlson. Ooh, the Chuck. Chuck. Okay. Chuck okay. is coming on to share some of her stories. So if you're looking for more of this content, more behind the scenes stories with your favorite pros, players, Kanama company owners, just show up next week, Saturday, 1 p.m. Tune Eastern. in, guys. We're going to be here. Catch it all on the podcast. It's all up there. <laughs> and if you love what you're hearing, and if you love it, And if you want to support the show and make it a little bit easier for me to do this every week, uh, we got a Patreon as well. You can get all the behind the scenes access there for five bucks a month and you get added to the close friend story. I share all the data, the stats, all that kind of stuff for the pod on there. So go check it out, support the show, have some fun and go use discount code Zach 2020 and save yourself some money. Do it. (laughs) Do it. All right, Zach, thank you so much for jumping on here and we will see you guys next week. See you guys next week. Thanks Adam.